Hello, everybody, and welcome into my latest live broadcast. Today it is the 2nd of February. It's Friday, 2024. Welcome in, everybody. And uh, first of all, before we go any further, I have to say that we have some very generous people in this community who absolutely deserve uh, to be acknowledged here for their generosity and effectively their sponsorship. Now, today's video, we're very proud to include the names on the thumbnail and in the build of four in particularly very recently, very generous individuals in the community who made today's build possible. This is not to downplay all the regular contributions and memberships. We appreciate each and every one of you, but I'm calling these gentlemen out because they're so far extreme in their generosity. Um, it's uh, unexpected and, and we're very lucky to have them. And that includes our friend Buster, Peter Laycock, of course, Oystein, who joins us from Norway, Frankie B. Frankie's in New York or New Jersey, I can't remember. And of course, Gregory Howard. With the generosity of these four gentlemen, we have the next three builds uh, already lined up. It would not have been possible without their support. Also, we want to give a special shout out and thanks to our friends at Acronis. They're here supporting us and hopefully you will consider supporting them back. If you're not backing up your computer, why not? You absolutely should be. And if you don't know how or you think it's too complicated, Acronis makes it very easy. It's very affordable. And on top of that, they're offering our audience a 30% discount all year on any Acronis product. And our friends at Instant House Call. At Instant House Call, that's the program I use for remote access. When clients call me for PC repair that I can do remotely, I use Instant House Call. You guys want to know what I use? I'll tell you what, I've used TeamViewer in the past, and I will call them out because I think they're a terrible company. They make a good product, but their customer service is non-existent. Their policy enforcement, rather than customer service oriented, and their contracts are extremely, extraordinarily difficult to cancel. I cannot suggest strong enough that you stay away from getting locked into a TeamViewer contract. You won't have that problem at Instant House Call. Instant House Call is very easy to cancel if you want to cancel it. I don't know why you would. They're way, way less expensive than TeamViewer. And they have a lot of built-in tools for diagnosing and repairing computers that simply don't exist on any other remote software that I'm aware of, unless you get into remote management software, which is a lot more than just remote access. Now, you can evaluate these for yourself. Don't take my word for it. You can check out free trials of Instant House Call and Acronos at your whimsy and decide for yourself. And, you know, Instant House Call is a small company and you can very easily reach out to the owner if you have any requests or uh, concerns. There's not too many companies today that uh, you get to talk directly with the owner and, and have some and get a response and have some influence on whether or not certain features are added, or maybe you need a little bit more time. Maybe the 15 day trial is not enough. You need a few more weeks, whatever. Corey Fruitman is a, is a great guy. We're gonna bring him on uh, in the next couple of weeks here. And we're gonna talk about the latest version of TeamViewer. Uh, TeamViewer, we're not gonna talk about TeamViewer. We're talking about Instant House Call <laughs> and all the features that were added. Wow, wow, we'll just edit that out. All right, now, uh, today, this is what we're here to talk about. And this is a really bizarre computer. And um, I'm gonna tell you how I got this. There's a little story behind this. And uh, first of all, I wanna shout out, say thank you to everybody who's already contributed in our super chat today. So let's do that first. Let me go back over to my, uh, my activity here. There it is. Okay, so Paul O'Brien kicked us off with a two euro contribution and he said, if there's not gonna be a party, I'm out of here. Hey, as long as you're here, it's a party. Thank you, Paul. Gregory Howard renews membership, now a member for five months. And he says, he says to Paul, they were both here very early before the show in the chat room. And he says, it looks like we're both anxious. Looks good, hello, Carrie in chat. And Paul O'Brien also renewed membership as well. He says, eight darn months. 
Right on. Yeah, you've been a member for eight months. Thank you, Paul. Ben Laird contributes two pounds, joins us from Scotland. Welcome in, Ben. 3D Everything with a $10 super chat says hello to the chat. Welcome in, 3D Everything. Ron Makura with two pounds says hello from Liverpool, England. Cheers, Ron. And Nick Caffrey with a 20 euro contribution says, looking forward to another memorable build with the best in the West. Arizona's in the West, right? <laughs> it is. Well, he says it is from my point of view. Believe me, from every boy's point of view, it's very, you think of Westerns and cowboy movies, right? What do you think of? The desert, tumbleweeds, it's generally, all, you know, Tombstone, Arizona. Yes, you got it right. Very West. Paul O'Brien with another contribution. Five euro. He says, blow Marlena a kiss to let her know she's the love of your life. <laughs> Is that all it takes? Ryan contributes $2 Canadian, says greetings from Hamilton, Ontario, also known as The Hammer. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you again, Paul. Mark Gaines joins us from Northern Ireland with a 10-pound super chat. He says, hello, Carrie, Marlena, and everyone in the chat. And Mark Baggett renews his membership here, now a member for 20 months. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. So let me tell you a story about how this build kind of happened. The, um, the issue that I have when I'm building computers is essentially getting rid of them after the video because I don't need, I mean, I'm buried up to my earballs computers. So, uh, what, you don't have earballs? Anyway, I have found somebody locally I can sell them to, but even he needs time to find the buyers. So I'm building them faster than I can sell them. So the result is that uh, I'm trying to add more diversity to the channel with regards to other types of content, especially with smaller things like, maybe like routers and mini PCs that aren't so big and take up so much room. And so that was the direction I was heading. I can, you know, routers in general are far cheaper or NAS devices, things like that. Less expensive. Make a video out of it, put it on a shelf, get it out of the way. Or maybe, you know, even use it myself, which is why recently we did the external SSD shootout because I will use the external SSDs. Unlike all these computers I'm building, I can't use them all. I want to, I just can't. So... Our friend, well, a couple of friends here, uh, Peter Laycock, Oystein, Frankie B, and Gregory Howard have been contributing. And towards the end of a show, Oystein made a very generous contribution. And it just kind of came from nowhere. And I thought, wow, you know, I guess with these contributions, I can go ahead and buy the parts to build another computer. But... I don't want to keep building the same thing. There's got to be something new, something, some reason to do a build that's, you know, different from other builds. So it's got to be a different design in the case or the Project Zero where all the cables are in the back. Something different we haven't shown before. And so I stumbled across this Cooler Master case here, and it was pretty pricey at $400. And of course, it's going to be a mini ITX, as you can tell. It's pretty small. It's an unusual color. It's uh, bronze, they call this. And in and of itself, I thought that was a lot of money for a, $400 for a case. But upon closer inspection, this case comes with a power supply that's already got the cables cut to the length that's required for this size of the case. And it comes with an all-in-one closed-looped a liquid cooler that's up here at the top but as you can see the top's not that not that big so we're looking at a 120 millimeter cooler but it's like double thick so normally a a cooler of that normally any radiator is about an inch thick this is like two inches thick so i figured okay if the cooler's worth about a hundred bucks the power supply is worth about a hundred bucks then the case is only 200 bucks. So I ordered it. There was one left in stock, according to Amazon, using the contribution that uh, the Amazon gift card that Oystein sent. 
Then, when we were live, Mara had come in here as I was promoting today's show, and she said, uh, there's a delay in the delivery. And after the show, I looked it up, and it said this case was not scheduled to arrive until the end of this month. It wasn't just a day or two late. So I asked Mara to get to work, find me another one so we can keep the show on as scheduled. Go to B&H Photo, go to New Ink, look around. Sold out everywhere. Find me a different color. Sold out everywhere. Okay. <laughs> so kind of thought about it for a little while, and I said, I I'm going to look on eBay. I'll, I'll look on Etsy. Nothing. No. I went back to Amazon. In fact, let's go to Amazon and take a look at the page. And I'll share that with you right now. Let's go right there. Okay. This says they have nine left in stock. This would imply that if you ordered this, you'd get it within a matter of days, right? It even says free delivery, but it's showing it's going to be uh, about two weeks. Why would it be two weeks if it's in stock? It doesn't make any sense. So what I did is I scrolled down here and I saw new and used right down here. And I click on that and it said they had a returned unit coming from Amazon, Amazon warehouse, and it was only like $10 off. I also looked on Reddit to see what people were saying about this case. And someone said they bought it and returned it because they decided that because the power supply and all-in-one cooler were already in it, that they were going to take those out and didn't want to pay for stuff they weren't going to use. So they sent it back. And that was my key to like, oh, maybe there's a returned one. I cannot emphasize enough the deals you guys can find on returned items from Amazon Warehouse. Now, the deals that are returned items, we don't know why they're returned. But I was between a rock and a hard spot, and I thought, you know what? I don't know if the return unit is the one this guy on Reddit sent back. There was only one available, and it was Amazon Warehouse, so I can send it back free of charge if I need to for any reason. And it said it'll arrive today, Friday. And then I got an email notice that said, good news, it's going to arrive a day early. And it came in yesterday. And then it looks like maybe somebody took it out of the box, but they didn't even open it. Everything looks brand new. Phew. As far as I can tell, maybe there was some buyer's remorse here, but nobody tried to build in this. Even the little sticker on the bottom of the water pump that, you know, you need to remove when you put the uh, thermal compound on. The sticker's still on, so they never built in it. Okay, so the show saved by <laughs> just getting lucky and thinking outside of the box, and I wanted to share that with you in case you run into a situation, and you also can save some money. So as I mentioned, this case just came out a couple weeks, uh, last month came out last month, and a number of YouTube channels have already reviewed it. I didn't see any of those videos. <laughs> I saw the case, and then I started looking for the videos afterwards. And so, you know, like Gamers Nexus did a, a great, as they always do, uh, overview of this case. And one of the things that Gamers Nexus mentioned is that because it's only a 120 millimeter cooler, you don't want to put a really high-end CPU in it's a high wattage CPU. We want to go with something more mid-range in order for that cooler to, you know, maintain that CPU temperature. So keeping that in mind, I went with the lower wattage uh, AMD Ryzen 7, the 7800X3D, I think is what we went with. And that's like a 65 watt processor, I want to say. So keep that in mind if you're considering ordering this. And down here on the bottom, right down here... You'll see that's our power button. We have a USB-C and two USB type A's there. And then we have a 3.5 millimeter audio jack. And then underneath here, you see how there's a big gap? That's because your motherboard is going to be, sorry, not your motherboard. Your, if you install a video card, it's going to face vertically down. So to plug your monitor into your video card, you would need to run the cable underneath and then up. 
On the other hand, as you can see kind of through the holes here, this would be the motherboard IO shield right here. So all of your motherboard ports are easily accessible around the back. Very, very different design, very different case. You're not looking at RGB, it's very subtle. It also is a lot smaller in person than I thought it was going to be. This thing's maybe two feet tall. It's not that bad. I thought it was like three feet tall from the pictures, so. Uh, next is the processor I'm using here, the 7800X3D. That's an eight core, 16 thread CPU. I decided to go with AMD on this one just because. I decided to waste my money and buy another one of these. <laughs> I don't know what my fascination is with these. I don't recommend them, <laughs> but I just kind of enjoy putting them on and I like how they look when they're put on, but I can't recommend them. This is because it's $9, it's just for fun. And then over here for a motherboard choice, I decided to go with this ASRock Lightning uh, V650i Mini ITX board. All these Mini ITX boards are gonna come with Wi-Fi. Um, this is a, um, Socket AM5, that's important. We gotta make sure that we're using socket AM5 and uh, it's going to take DDR5 RAM. So for the RAM, we're going to use the OLOY. I, this is sort of a newer brand and they're very, very price aggressive and I really like the quality and reliability of the memory. So I don't think it can be beat for the price. Again, no RGB on that. So, you know, about a hundred bucks, 32 gigs. DDR5 6000. And again, when it comes to bargains, I think Feijing makes a very, very fast Gen 4 NVMe drive that's much cheaper than anybody else with the reliability and performance that it comes with. Now, prices have gone up a little bit on these. They were just below 100 bucks. Now they're about 129, and the price may continue to climb as SSD and RAM prices are expected to go up by 20 to 30%. This year, as manufacturers are slowing down the production of the chips intentionally to increase the value of the chips so they make more money. Whether or not that becomes a price fixing lawsuit in the future remains to be seen, but this is the reality we live in for now. Unless something changes, I'll let you know. But if you think it's expensive now, just wait. So if you're putting off a build, and you're waiting for prices to go down, if that's the reason why you're putting it off, maybe wait till next year, because this year we're in an upswing, at least as far as RAM and storage go. Uh, let's go back over to camera one. And then the other thing I wanna show you is the component box. This was enclosed. Basically, these are the two things you get when you open up the box that this comes in. You're gonna take this out and you're gonna take this out. And one of the ways I can tell how something or if something was used when I'm buying something returned at Amazon is to look at the condition of the box. You can tell when somebody's rewrapped the cable. You can tell if somebody's repackaged anything because people never do it right. Everything's like brand new. I can tell this has never been used. Now you'll notice there is another lid in here. And the reason this includes this other lid is this case has the ability to extend out widthwise by about an inch, inch and a half. And that's to accommodate if you've got a very large GPU. So it will accommodate that. However, you're not gonna have very good airflow in that sense, and you'll see why. And again, I would recommend you watch Gamers Nexus review on this. When you get into, you know, a high-end, super high-end GPU and a super high-end processor, you're likely going to have heat-related issues. However, um, the, there are bigger cards where you would need to expand this that wouldn't necessarily be the super high-end. In other words, there may be cards of yesteryear that are that big that aren't as powerful as today's cards that perhaps don't run as hot. So there are a, a reasons why you'd want to expand this case out for the, to accommodate that. We are just going to be using integrated graphics. I'm not paying for any graphics cards. I think they're wildly overpriced. And I think the integrated graphics on modern CPUs, it's nothing to shake a stick at. I think they're uh, 
acceptable for most users except uh, hardcore gamers. And look, if you're a hardcore gamer, I, I got nothing against it. I just, I don't make that kind of money. And I don't have that kind of spare time. But you can add your own GPU to this build, you know, everything else remaining the same. All you have to do is add the GPU, follow along with our build. Uh, also in here, we've got some bags that have never been opened. These bags are, well, these are Ziplocs. Sometimes when they're sealed, you know, you can tell when they've been opened because you can't reseal them. But with Ziplocs, you can't really tell. But these are the back plates for the liquid cooler. For liquid cooling mounting, we've got some zip ties and we have some screws. And what's this? This has been taped closed. What's this? These look like extra, uh, these look like GPU power connectors to go onto the power supply, which if you're not going to use the GPU, you wouldn't want to attach these because then it just gets in the way and it's more tables to manage. So I, I like that that's optional. We have also a very large, thick power cable here. Uh, 850 watts is the power supply. Now, should one of our generous contributors want this build, whether that's Gregory Howard, Frankie B, Oystein, even though Oystein lives in Norway and Peter Laycock lives in Scotland, I will figure out how to get it there because I cannot thank them enough. And once again, once we build this, I have no use for it. So, um, the people who've made this possible, I'm just trying to find an appropriate way to show my gratitude. And um, all they have to say is, I'll take it. I'll, I'll figure out a way to get it to them because uh, they've basically paid for it. So our thanks to them for today's content. I cannot believe the generosity. Even, even today, Peter Laycock and Frankie B both contributed again which goes to another future build. We're going to do a project zero. You're like, well, I thought you were going to do different things. You already did that. We did it in micro ATX. I didn't do a full ATX because as far as I could tell, there were no full ATX project zero compatible cases. Now there is. So a full size MSI project zero ATX motherboard along with a ATX Project Zero compatible case, this time in black instead of white, this time Intel instead of AMD. And we'll take a look at how those are different and yet similar. So that build will be coming up. And then there's a couple other, I think there's two other builds, two or three, which I'm not prepared to talk to you about because <laughs> much like this, until I have the parts on hand, I don't, this is like Murphy's Law. If I start promoting it, then something happens and I can't get the parts, right? So We'll wait until I have the parts, and then I'll be able to tell you ease those builds as uh, time permits. Let me take another look in the chat room here and see what you guys are saying. Yeah, in fact, I'm expecting a, a micro ATX compatible case to arrive for the next, I think it's the next build or the build after that. And that should be arriving today, but just in case it doesn't, <laughs> I just don't want to be stressed out like I was with this. We got really lucky with this. All right. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Just looking for any questions or comments before we start dismantling this. So again, um, our thanks to all of the contributors because with those contributions, generally speaking, that's what keeps the channel rolling at its current pace. But when we have the exceptional generosity, uh, I deserve that. 
I believe that deserves to be called out on its own, but it's not to dismiss or to undermine, of course. I appreciate all the contributions, but just keep in mind that this build would not have been possible. Those contributions would not have been enough to pay for this. So those four gentlemen are being singled out uh, strictly because without them, this particular content would not be. That's all I'm saying. It's not, let's not take something meant to show appreciation and turn it into anything negative, please. So um, it's not meant as a diss to anybody. Now on the back of this case, you'll see that there's, first of all, you're gonna notice there's no screws anywhere. And everything um, is, is a toolless design. And so there's this little sticker here that tells you to remove the panel you pull. And it's gonna have like cabinet door type style clicks not push in and push out, but just, you know, you pull on it and it's got a, uh, a little plastic clip on the case itself with a little brass or metal knob that goes inside of it. <laughs> Gregory Howard contributes 20 bucks. He says, please give it to someone who needs it. I already have too many computers. <laughs> well, we'll see what uh, Peter Laycock, uh, Frankie B and, um, and Oystein say about that. Yeah. Sorry, I'm reading the chat and talking at the same time. Probably not a good idea. All right, let me, let me just see how this comes apart here. So no rehearsals, there's no scripts. Everything is live. Just pull on that. And then I, after I pull on this piece, I can hear it pop. There's two, two places. And then I guess I do the same thing over here. Pull on that, pull on that. So this doesn't swing open like a door, just so you know, there's two more. Or am I wrong? Does it swing open? Oh, it looks like these tabs would come towards me. So the problem is if you swing it open like a door, you could break the tabs off of it. It's what it looks like. So be very gentle. If you're, if you're ordering one of these and you're going to build one, just to show you a close up here, these are the, the little metal nubs. And you'll see how those stick out as they're pointing up. But on this side, right up here, they're pointing in a different direction. They're pointing towards you. So you definitely need to uh, approach pulling this off. Um, one end of it, well, here, just like the diagram shows, I guess, would probably be the best way <laughs> Just follow the sticker. <laughs> and then you can see this is where our uh, IO shield will be, I guess. I think. And then we've also got filter material here. I'm trying to figure out how that is off. Thought it was magnet. Anyway, you can you can see there's these little pieces here that are holding the screen in for dust filtering. It's all part of it right there. All right, let's try the other side. So, you can see we've got a cooling fan there. Now, I think I pull this side towards me. Ah, so everything comes towards me. That's the way it is. So when I'm pulling off the short side towards me, I'm also pulling off the long side towards me at the same time. That makes a lot of sense. That, that's totally logical. So you're not pulling from two different directions. One clean pull towards you should take an unclip. Both the clips going in this way. The, the clips going in this way. So they're, they're facing the same direction. I, I will stand corrected again. All the clips are going in the same direction. So a straight pull is all that should be required. Now, I certainly don't want to damage these. We're going to set them aside so they don't get knocked over stepped on, scratched. 
We'll set them aside here. And you will also notice, just an FYI, that these clips can come off. You see there's screws here. Okay, there's one screw, it's right there. And then this can slide up and come off. I'm not exactly sure what the steps are to expand the case out that extra inch, but that might have something to do with it. So I am going to then set this one down over here. And now what we've got is our bare computer case, but you will see we've got our pre-installed 850 watt power supply already there. Right up here is our radiator for our liquid cooler. And that is going to be about yay thick. It is the thickest liquid cooler radiator I have ever seen. And this top can come off. I don't know if it's supposed to be toolless, right? Just lift straight up. And there you can see the radiator on top. And on the other side is the fan. And that fan is in a configuration that it's pulling air in, which explains why this has a screen. We don't, we don't need to filter exhaust air. So it's gonna draw air in from the top down through here. We've got a rear exhaust fan right here. It's gonna blow air out. We have a, a GPU riser cable right here. If we're going to put a graphics card in, that's all that goes on this side of the case. That is reserved for your graphics card. And as you can see, there's no airflow through there. So if you have a giant high powered graphics card, you could run into some thermal issues. But anything other than the extreme stuff should run fine. And then on this side, this is our water pump for our liquid cooler. As you can see, every, all the cables and hoses are custom cut at the factory for this particular case so that you're not going to have any excess. Everything should fit without needing any major cable management. Thank the Lord. And then let's just get this protection out of here. And that's just apparently there uh, to keep the water pump from bouncing around and dam getting damaged. And then this piece here, so that's water pump power and fan power. And this piece, this will plug into the motherboard. Think of it like an extension cable for your graphics card. So instead of plugging the graphics card in, right, because our motherboard's going to sit this way, and the graphic card would go in this way. Instead, we're going to plug this extension cable into the slot we'd normally use for the graphics card. And then it comes around to the other side and changes it to a vertical orientation. So that way, we're going to plug our graphics card in with the end of the graphics card with the HDMI ports facing down. As you can see, these are our PCIe slots right down here. So if I wanted, excuse me, if I wanted to use this as a streaming computer, what I would do is I would use the integrated graphics, you know, buy a CPU that's got integrated graphics, number one, Intel or AMD, doesn't matter. And then I would use an internal video capture card. And I would have no way to plug that capture card in on this side of the case. So regardless, we are going to plug this cable in whether we're using it or not. So that way we have this slot available to us, not just for a graphics card, but we can also use it for any card, any card at all. That's uh, PCI Express. So even though my capture card is only a small little connector, it'll fit right in there no differently. And I'll just have to access it, you know, by running the cables underneath that I need for the capture card. But everything else, as far as the uh, motherboard I.O., that's going to be easily accessible right here. And once again, just as a reminder, um, 
there it is. Our power button right here. Can't really see it. Right here. In the shape of the Cooler Master logo. And then just to your left on the bottom here, you'll see our USB ports, 3.5 millimeter audio jack and a USB type C. So it's really well equipped and really compact. It looks like a nice clean design. The other thing I noticed is we have these, these little latches. Do you see that? And that just moves like this and like this. And I think that's the thing you adjust if you want to expand the case to be a little bit longer. And that just swings up like a door and it can come off entirely. I might want to just pay a little closer attention to what I'm doing. Because <laughs> um, I'm going to have to figure out how to put that back on later. And it does have some tape on it here, I've noticed. It looks like uh, on this piece, maybe to keep you from, I don't know, injuring yourself or something. They've got a little tape on it. Take the tape off. Here, and we'll go here. So that's that piece. Pretty unique piece. Can't say I've ever seen a piece like that on any case before. So we'll figure out how that fits and why it's there. But I do believe that's the key to expanding the case to be larger, and I have no intention of doing that. The rest of our umbilicals are tied up right here in this corner. So I see a bundle of cables. Um, I don't see where the end of it. Got our riser cable, our CPU power cable. Oh, there we go. So that's our front port USB. What else do we have? Front port audio, front port USB type C. I'm sure there's a power cable in there somewhere. Power switch, I mean. My only concern, my only reservation about this case is what happens when the pump dies? And it will die. Where are you going to find another pump of that size apart from relying on the manufacturer to sell it to you uh, or provide it to you, you know, under warranty? When, when it's, what about when it's out of warranty? That's not a standard configuration that radiator is this thick so i don't know where you'd get one to replace it and i don't know if you could fit a thinner radiator in there and if that would work without causing potential heat problems depending on what cpu you've selected that's the only downside i can see obviously changing the power supply out is not a big deal it's a small form factor power supply you can buy those very easily and while you may not have the custom cut cables anymore, big deal. But with regards to the cooler, yeah, I, I do have a little concern about when the pump dies, and it will die. Usually they have a lifespan of about five years. Some last a little longer, uh, some last not so long. But this is a part that will not last as long as everything else. And I don't know what you would do to get another one. It's as far as I know, not available for sale from any manufacturer. So we have a proprietary design here just in this cooler. So apart from that, everything else looks very doable and uh, really nice design, if you ask me, on this case. Very nicely. Uh, you, it's unique. It's out of the box. It's different from all of the same designs we've been looking at over and over where they just you know, everybody's doing these dual chamber cases now. I don't know why people want a big wide case that looks like a fish tank. Um, we've got a couple of them here, and they're just unwieldy. They're just too big, in my opinion. This is the opposite of that. It's much, much smaller. It's also not flashy. You're not going to get the RGB. Uh, hopefully, it'll be quiet. We'll see how the, the three fans run, right? So we have three fans in the sense that we've got a rear case fan. We've got a radiator fan and we have the power supply fan. All right, one more look here in the chat room. Let's see what you guys are talking about. 
Can you replace the all-in-one with an air cooler? Well, you know, that's a good question because you don't have a lot of depth here to work with. Uh, if you look, right here is where the motherboard's going to go, all right? So when we put the board in, we don't really have any space for a cooler to go on there. I'm not even sure a low profile cooler, I'm sure there is a low profile cooler that will fit, but you would have to have a pretty low power CPU to keep it cool. Where you've got good ventilation through here, but um, I, I think you'd be wanting to run maybe a, a Ryzen 3 or an i3, something extremely low power if you wanted to use a low profile cooler. I think you, I don't know if the processor we picked here, which is a 65 watt Ryzen 7, if uh, an air cooler that's low profile that's gonna squeeze in that little space would be adequate to keep us from thermal throttling. There's a reason why there's a liquid cooler on this. So just bear that in mind. Um, who's to say in four or five years when the pump gives out that there's not some extraordinary new cooling technology that comes out between now and then. This technology that, you know, being in computers, it's evolving so quickly and they've got all kinds of different uh, techniques they're introducing for cooling, including little piezo coolers for NVMe drives. And who knows, maybe that evolves into CPU coolers. I mean, it would be really neat. I almost said really cool. It would be really neat if that comes to fruition and, and, and it evolves to that. But in the meantime, whether or not you could use a, an air cooler on that would be, depending on the cooler and the CPU, you have very limited clearance, something to keep in mind. Likely the answer is no, but, you know, a lot of variables to determine whether or not that's gonna work. Dennis says, I love your content. You've opened my eyes to the variety of options available in computers today. Right on. Well, thank you, Dennis. Glad to have you here. Let's see what else I've missed here in the chat. Captain Linsky said, it's the thought that counts with the contribution, not the amount. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. And as I mentioned, um, we don't want to become what most of the other YouTube tech channels are, which are commercials. You know, I've jokingly said that if your ad blocker really worked, it wouldn't let you watch most of the tech content out there because they're not very critical in most cases of what they're reviewing. And in most cases, they're being paid to review it by the company. And even when they're not, if they are critical and the company had sent them the product, they likely, the company likely won't send them another product if the review is not flattering. So for their own self-survival, they, if they want to keep getting content from the company, you better not be too harsh. So long as we're independent, just like myself as a real working computer technician, nothing guides my repairs from any corporations. I don't sell certain power supplies to customers because I get a kickback, right? That doesn't happen. I sell the right part that I think solely my own belief, I don't need anybody else's approval, the part that I think is best for my customer. That's the first and foremost priority that I have. The second priority is that the part is going to be reliable, affordable, available, and if I sell a customer a part that maybe has more profit in it, but turns out that it needs warranty, I've already lost money because I have to do the warranty work for free. And I may lose a customer for life who feels like, you know, even though it's no fault of my own, that they're inconvenienced with a computer that doesn't work, that shouldn't have failed when it's so new or just repaired. So I'm very, very cautious over what I'm allowing to represent my quality, right? Because from a customer's perspective, they're not thinking of manufacturer names. They don't know Asus from Cooler Master. It means nothing to them. All they know is I hired Carrie, they paid Carrie, and now the work Carrie did isn't working. 
that's not going to keep Carrie in business. As Carrie speaks in the third person. So that's why when I hear comments, sometimes unwanted comments from the chat room regarding the decision making, um, they're not the ones that get the call from the customer and they're not the ones that have a business to sustain. Instead, they're missing the point that I'm just sharing my experience running a business with you. I'm not asking you how to do it. I'm showing you how I do it. That's all I'm doing. I'm not suggesting you should follow me. And I'm not suggesting that you should offer me corrections. It's simply a window into the daily life of a real computer repair technician, which is very, very rare on social media, especially here on YouTube. There are few working texts here on YouTube, but they are few and far between to the people just looking to make a lot of money and become influencers. That's their goal. You know, trying to figure out what it's going to take to get the audience, the biggest audience possible. I don't want, let me be clear. I don't want the biggest audience possible. I want the best audience. And I feel like that's what I have. I feel like I would rather have 300 of you guys watching live than 3,000 of the nutcases out there that, well, you've seen them on YouTube that, you know, harass and uh, just are, are disrespectful and inconsiderate, they're selfish. I, good riddance to them. I'm glad they're not here in our chat room. So that's my priority. And, uh, and it wouldn't be so without your participation. So I thank you guys for being the cool people you are because that's what makes this so enjoyable for me. Alan Lindus contributes $17.77 in Super Chat. Carrie, he says, another late fee. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Alan. Thank you for the contribution. David Graham contributes two bucks. He says, you are the best. Hey, thank you, David. You're the best. Paul O'Brien with five euros says, Thanks to Peter Laycock, Gregory Howard, Oystein, and Frankie B for tonight's build, as well as the next two builds to follow. Again, these builds would not, this build and the next two are a direct purchase from the generosity of those four gentlemen. And I can't emphasize that enough. And again, all the contributions, they add up. Smaller contributions add up. Make no mistake about it. I appreciate each and every one of you. Even just your participation here in the chat room means a lot to me. And I thank you for that. It's not all about money all the time. But what the money does is it enables us to do higher end stuff and to do it more often. That's all. And again, I don't need the computer. I do this for you guys. How I spend that money, it's not like... Anybody told me, use this money to buy this. It was, they trust my judgment. And uh, I wanted to bring you some unique content. Now with that, maybe we need to get Camera Girl out here for some close-up work because we need to get the motherboard prepped and get some work underway. I'm going to put this aside. I'd put it back, but I'm not exactly sure where it goes. So I'll we'll set that aside for now. That's okay. We'll figure that out later. And then we're going to just take these extra parts and I need to find a place to set them because I have a very small workspace here. So let me just set this back over here. Hey, camera girl. Yes, I would like uh, one camera work to go, please. Is that paper or plastic? You gained a few inches, huh? All right, I'm just going to set this stuff over there. Uh, no, um, there's an HDMI cable that has to plug into that. We can yeah. take, let's take that cable off mm -hmm. and plug this cable in right here. Except Don't mind us, guys. It's, it's, it's live <laughs> and unscripted. So as we stumble around here in the studio getting things ready, I failed to prepare that prior to the show. I just realized now. Come on over and we'll get you here on close up camera. Go ahead. There she is. All right. Very good. Hey, you know that case almost matches the color of this. Hmm. 
It's a very unusual color. They called it bronze. Do me a favor, just step over this way. There we go. I, I don't like shooting down the hallway because it's a big mess back there and it's embarrassing. All right, so uh, parts. Here's what we've got. This is our AM5 socket frame, which is our contact frame. Again, I, I, I think they're fun. I don't know why I'm twisted that way. I think it's a waste of money. But, you know, most things that are fun, like Disneyland is a waste of money. You go there, you spend a day, and you leave, and you've got nothing to show for it. So anyway, but you had a good time, right? Where's our S880, our two terabyte Feijing? I know it looks like it says Rangjena, doesn't it? But it actually has a letter F and a letter G that they have a different color on the top and bottom of those letters. Feijing, or however it's pronounced. Here's our Ryzen 7. Does that have a heat sink in it? It doesn't feel heavy enough. And then if you look at the top, that will give you our details. If it'll focus. And then our DDR5 RAM from OLOY, non-RGB, save us a few bucks, since we're not going to see the RGB through that case anyway. And then finally, for the motherboard, I chose the ASRock B650i Lightning. I kind of felt like this was the best value for the money on looking at ASRock Gigabyte and um, MSI. ASRock Gigabyte MSI, who am I missing? Asus. Um, this seemed, at least for what was available, the most value for the money for what I was looking for personally. Older wants to know where you can buy the bronze keyboard. That's uh, available at Amazon. And if you look in my video notes below this video, there is a link that, you know, a lot of people want to know where I got the tools I use or the flash drives I use or the keyboards I use. And so for that, there's over a hundred items of different tools and equipment that people constantly ask me about. And so we have a link to that Amazon store that has all of that, including the keyboard. Alternately, you could just search ASIO, A-Z-I-O, on Amazon or on Google to look for their products. We bought this keyboard. They're not a sponsor. They've never sent us anything for free. So just FYI. Um, whether or not you pay for it or buy it, I don't make any money from it. And unless, unless you use my Amazon link and then I make a small commission. Just so you know, just for full disclosure. It's a very tiny little commission. You know, I make a dollar. But again, it all adds up. It doesn't cost you any different. So be sure and please check out our video notes below the video that will also have links to all of the parts individually for today's build, including this board, which I'm going to open up here for the very first time. You can see it's super tiny. Mini ITX. Ooh, it's kind of heavy. Ooh. Here we go. Got a little feel here. So one of the things that attracted me to the board was just all the I.O. on the back. I like a lot of USB ports. Of course, we have to have a, at least one HDMI out since I'm not planning to put a GPU in this. On the other hand, I'm not planning to keep this. And so whoever ends up with it may want to put a GPU in it, in which case this doesn't matter. We've got a uh, USB type C back here. What is this? What does that button say right there? Is that a BIOS update thing? I got to get my glasses out so as I can see. Yeah, so <laughs> if you recall, we've done this procedure before last Friday. No, two Fridays ago. Um, where you can update the motherboard BIOS without any CPU or RAM installed. Now that we know how to do that, we could certainly try that, although it wouldn't be necessary, it shouldn't be necessary for this chip. But the AMD Ryzen 8700G comes out tomorrow. And for this to be compatible with the 8700G, you might need a BIOS update. 
what would happen is when you turn the system on, it just it powers on, but nothing happens on your screen. And that would imply that the computer is not recognizing the CPU. The way it recognizes the CPU is through a BIOS update. Since that chip did not exist, the 8700G did not exist when this motherboard was designed, there's a good chance that if we were using the latest AM5 CPU from AMD, that it wouldn't recognize it without the BIOS update. And so what you'd have to do is put an older CPU in here so that you could get the BIOS update. Then you can put the new CPU in after that. Or if you're lucky, your board will have one of these buttons on the back. Not many boards have these. And the boards that typically have them are AMD boards. And you're gonna push that button in and it will flash the latest BIOS, put on me, it'll flash the latest BIOS with no CPU and no RAM on the board. It's wicked. But don't cheap out on your flash drive. We learned the hard way that if you use some generic flash drive, there's a good chance it'll just sit there and blink and just do it indefinitely and never end and do nothing. So I will use a name brand SanDisk or, you know, some other name brand. For me, I prefer SanDisk flash drive. And the whole update process shouldn't take more than 10 minutes. That, that's about three times longer than if we do it, you know, the way you're accustomed to seeing me do it, where we have CPU and RAM, we go into the BIOS. That takes about three minutes on average. This takes a little more than three times longer. So you do need to have patience and faith because you, you just have no indication what's going on other than a flashing light. And like I said, last time when we did it, I used my cheap flash drive, which is fine for normal flashing, but for this kind of flashing, it does require, at least with ASRock boards, uh, uh, a name brand, higher end flash drive. I don't know why it makes no sense to me, but that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm here to share this information with you so you don't have to go through the same frustrating, bizarre experience that I did. We go through this together. That's another reason why I don't like any rehearsals. I don't like any um, scripts or editing. I like to keep everything in so you see the struggles are real and that you won't have those struggles. You'll have different struggles I didn't have, <laughs> just to be clear. All right, so back in the box here, we should also have our accessories. Okay, we got a piece of cardboard here that we don't need to keep. We've got documentation. We've got some Velcro ties and some focusing issue. Mm -hmm. We've got SATA cables and an M.2 screw right there. And then also this fell out. This is antenna for the Wi-Fi, two of those. That's everything. All right, so I'm gonna put this here. Now, uh, a couple of lessons we learned from the last time is that when we're gonna put the socket, the contact frame in here, we wanna leave these pieces on for right now. Uh, I made the mistake of taking them off before, and then there was nothing holding the back plate in. So we need the back plate held up for us. So when we take the frame out of here, um, there's something holding the back plate up. I think the contact frames aren't very beneficial. I just think they're fun to put in. And I also like how things look. It does complicate matters if you want to switch your CPU out. It means you've got to unscrew the contact frame versus just lifting a lever. So I'm not recommending this for any of you. I'm just doing it for unique content. All right, let me uh, see what we got in here. We've got our contact frame itself here. Oh, it's got a little chrome edge to it. They've given us some thermal compound and we will be using these screws. They normally include, yeah, there's a little Torx wrench included to remove the screws. Now, 
One of the other things I found is that I should put the CPU in first. So let's go ahead and move that aside for right now. Let's get the CPU out of the box. There we go. I think the rest of this box is just filler. I don't, isn't that weird? They use that much just for this. There's nothing else in here, I think, but filler. Isn't that weird? Very strange. Chat room says our camera is in standard definition in four by three. Hmm. Is the camera settings changing on its it own? It says standard. It says standard on it? I'll tell you what, let me go back to, go ahead and step over here for me, Will. Let's go back to camera one, and let me see that camera real quick. Just hand it to me. Did we accidentally change the, yeah, I think we, style got spun. Sometimes when we hand the camera back and forth, I think, you know, I might have just hit this dial that's on top. And then that puts us into a different mode. So in theory, I think, let's check a couple other settings. Okay, that's for panorama. Should be right there. I think that's correct. Let me hand that back. And then you guys in the chat can let me know if that looks any better. I think that's all it was. Just a little slip like that, and suddenly your video quality gets... Oh, that's much better. You think it's better? <laughs> yeah. All right, let me have you step back over here, and we'll let the audience decide. Are we better now, guys? Let me know. Um, I'm going to get a fresh Gatorade. I'm going to wait for the audience to respond. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. It's hard for me to tell. Steve McCure says much gooder. Luke Greenia says way better. Okay, guys. So uh, note to self, when we use that camera, we got to be mindful of that dial. Thankfully, we haven't done anything critical yet. If you want some close-ups of this board, just to take a look at for example, the rear I.O. panel, as well as where our connectors are. Yeah, that's so in focus. <laughs> yeah. Now I see it says BIOS flash right there. BIOS flashback, FLBK. And then, uh, of course, our stubs for the antennas there on the, uh, the right side. Okay. Do, 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 do. I'm going to put this back. Keep an organized mess here. That way it'll look good in the recycling facility. All right. Just throw that over here with the rest of the junk. There's our chip. The documentation that we have left over will go in the motherboard box. So, putting in the CPU. Once again, what I have found to be an ideal way of working smarter and not working harder is to put the CPU in like you normally would before we take this frame off. And you don't have to take this frame off. I have to emphasize what I'm doing these next few steps um, are strictly because I, 
I think it's fun and I like the way it looks, but this is all you need, okay? But for nine bucks to buy this frame, it replaces this whole socket area. This, uh, this whole piece comes off and gets replaced with this. Now, one of the things we wanna look for before we get too started here, is we look for the little arrow. And you will see we have the arrow here, and you'll see we have the arrow here. So this piece is gonna go on in that direction. And our CPU also has the arrow right there, golden triangle or arrow. So I'm gonna take the CPU out and we're gonna install it like we normally would. And if I go that direction, you guys can't see anything. So we'll turn it. So bearing in mind the, the arrow was facing, which way was it? It's, it's the top, from my perspective, it's the top left. That means that this is gonna go in like this and I'm gonna set this down using, see how my fingers kind of extend a little bit? I wanna feel that plastic here on the edge. Stay away from these pins, they're very easily damaged. Just set that down and make sure that it's in there. Um, it won't seat any other way. So if I were to have this arrow in any of the other corners, it won't sit flush, It'll, and, and you don't want that. With that seated, it's also gonna protect those pins. So we can now remove these four Torx bolts to pull that socket, uh, the, this mechanism is going to come out. So for that, I'm going to go into the toolkit that came with our contact frame, and I'm going to pull this little wrench out, and we're going to use that. Does the CPU support Gen 5? Um, I don't know if the CPU does, but the motherboard doesn't. I don't believe this is a Gen 5 PCIe on this board. Uh, you guys can correct me, look it up. Pretty sure... This board is Gen 4. If you decide to do what I'm doing and you want to take these bolts out, you'll notice they're not very tight. The reason I mention that is when you go to put the replacement on, keep that in mind that you don't over tighten them. Wintermute says that the CPU is Gen 5. Thank you, Wintermute. But what about the motherboard? So you can have Gen 5 through your PCIe socket, right? So that your video card's running on Gen 5. But whether or not your M.2 is running on Gen 5 is dependent on the motherboard you use. So I'm waiting to see somebody in the chat. Confirm. So with those lifted out, this whole frame comes out. And we don't recycle or reuse any of that for our replacement. We're going to use the screws the replacement comes with. So I'm going to just put that lever back down, and this is just a leftover part at this point. So in this bag now, we've got the screws we're going to need here. They're going to use the same Torx. Peter contributes one euro. Thank you, Peter. And he does it again. Thank you again. All right, so there's the screws. So remember now, you see where our gold triangle is there, right? And you see our triangle here. So that tells us this is going to go on this direction. I'm trying to orient this in the best way possible for you. It's going to just sit like so. Perfect. Looks good though, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Now, we are not going to be using this. I'm pretty sure that our cooler comes with its own mounting. So I think these can come off, but not yet. We have to secure this first. And so the order in which I have done this is critical if you want to not work harder than you need to. I have learned the hard way, which is, for me, the best way I personally learn. 
So I can tell you from experience, what I'm doing is I wind back the screw here. When I put the screw in, and I'm sure my microphone with noise suppression on is blocking the sound, but I'm going to wind it in the unscrew direction. And you're going to, you will hear and feel it uh, slip into the threads below. Then I start to tighten it. But just, just about a single turn just to get it started. And we're going to repeat that with these four screws here. Wind it back. You'll hear it click and you'll feel it sink down. And that's how you can ensure that you're not cross-threading anything. Because that would be a bad day if you cross-threaded it. So wind it back. Here's the click. And we can go forward. Now, it's important we tighten these all down evenly. If you go around in a big circle, you may end up with this end tighter than this end and this thing warping and being a little twisted, which would be nearly impossible to see with the naked eye. So what we want to do is tighten these as evenly as possible. So what I do is I'll go to opposite corners and just to the point of getting resistance. I'm just using two fingers. The minute two fingers can't turn it and the fingers start sliding around this wrench, that's when I know at this point, this is where it matters. This is where we want to make sure we're doing even tightening. So for the best tightening, we'll use the other side. Then we have all of this leverage to use. And you'll see it doesn't go very far. I'm going to go to the opposite corner. And even that is probably much tighter than the originals. I am probably tightening this twice as tight as what I removed. So whatever you do, don't crank down on them, but make sure that they're not going to vibrate loose. You don't want them loose, but you also don't want to shear the heads off of it by over tightening it. And that's why I want you, if you're going to put one of these on your Intel or AMD CPU, I want you to pay attention to when you take the originals out, feel how loose they are and use that as your guide. I put them back a little bit tighter, but that's just my personal choice. Now we've got a go faster sticker. We don't want to throw that away because, you know, system will go faster if we put that sticker on. Now that will go in the motherboard box too. And then uh, NVMe drives. So this is a pretty big heat sink right here. I'm assuming this is for our NVMe. We don't normally see heat sinks this big unless it's Gen 5. So I could be wrong about the, about the Gen 5. Wintermute says one of the M.2s is connected to the CPU and it does do Gen 5. So my guess is, thank you, Wintermute. My guess is this giant heat sink right here is for Gen 5. Now, I'm not putting a Gen 5 in this. If I were going to put a Gen 5 in this, I would put a higher end CPU. I am trying to be very mindful of the heat and of the expenses. Um, we've used Gen 5 in the past, and I will use that on the really expensive chips and boards. It's nice to know we've got it if we want it. Now, Wundermute mentions this has two M.2s, but I only see one. So is there one back here? Ah, right here is another M.2 slot. Because these mini ITX boards are so small, some of them, have a second or a third M.2 back behind the board. What sucks about choosing this position is if you should need to replace that or access that for any reason, it may require you to pull the entire motherboard out of your computer case. Not that I'm replacing them or upgrading them very often, but it's something to keep in mind. You'll also notice we have a place here with a screw that is missing, and I'm going to guess that's what this enclosed screw is for that came with the motherboard. And whether I use this or not, I will put that screw in there so I don't have to go and find it a year or two years from now. Or the customer doesn't call me a year or two asking me where it is if they decide to use it. So we will use this Gen 5 socket because of the heatsink, but we're going to use a Gen 4 drive in it. It is backwards compatible. So this is a nicer board. Than <laughs> I, I knew I bought a good board but I wasn't expecting the Gen 5. 
but I'm glad to see it's got it. When Gen 5 becomes more affordable, perhaps it'll be something worthy to upgrade. But for today, Gen 4 is significantly cheaper, and most people can't see the difference anyway. Now, what's interesting, let me just make sure here, it looks like, if we look at the heat sink, we've got some thermal tape here. Um, if you're going to use a Gen 5, you absolutely want to use the motherboard heat sink. This thing is a monster. And these motherboard heat sinks are going to work far better for Gen 5 than, believe it or not, if you order a Gen 5 NVMe with its own heat sink, it will not work as well as the ones the motherboards include. And it also matches aesthetically the look of the board. The reason why only that is Gen 5 and not this one is we would have no way to cool this. So a Gen 5 drive, if that were a Gen 5 socket, would very easily overheat back there. And if your NVMe that you're putting back here has a built-in heatsink, then this likely won't be able to sit properly in your motherboard, uh, in your computer case. So we are making some accommodations for the small form factor of Mini-ITX. I just want you to be aware of it. And thanks again, Wintermute, for looking that up for me. I appreciate it. All right, let's get our NVMe drive out of here. So this is a two terabyte. Gen 4 NVMe. This is no slouch. This thing is, is going to run super fast, probably over 7,000 megabytes per second on the reads. And we're definitely not going to have any cooling problems with a monster heat sink like that on there. It should run nice and cool. And then we're not breaking the bank, you know, buying a Gen 5 drive. But it's nice to know that we can. So Feng Jing is nice that they give us a little M.2 screw in case we lose one. And they give us this super teeny tiny little two inch screwdriver, which I guess is great if, uh, if you're Barbie and Ken need a mechanic okay. to fix the Barbie Corvette. I don't know. Let's go ahead and take that out. Here's our Beijing drive. our notch. This only goes in one way. So we'll set that here. Bring in a bit of an angle, sort of wiggle and push at the same time until all the gold fingers disappear. And then it sort of springs up and down. Now there is no individual screw that holds this down except uh, it's from the heat sink. You'll notice there's nothing else here. So heat sink is not optional. We have to use it. We're going to take the tape off of the off of the thermal tape here, and this keeps it free of any contamination so that our heat transfer is going to be optimal. And then we put this back on in the way that it came off, which will be sort of like, sort of like that screwdriver again. Once again, we don't want to tighten anything down. We just want to get it started here and then started over here. If you could get the camera down low, I want the audience to see what I'm looking for. So instead of tilting the camera, keep the camera straight and then get down lower. And you can see right in there, I'm aligning that screw with the uh, mount point right back there. Here we go. See it. Now that I've got them both started, I'll start to Tighten them down. Again, we mostly want to do this evenly so that we don't have uh, an uneven application of that thermal tape. We want the drive covered evenly as much as possible. And we're just going to turn these till the screws stop. There's no reason to tighten them any further. Once you start feeling the screw doesn't want to move forward, stop trying to turn it forward. <laughs> so there we've got our CPU installed in our Gen 2 NVMe. All that remains, of course, is putting the RAM in. 
but I think now would be a good time for us to seat the motherboard into the case because I don't have an external cooler to use. This is normally the point where I would fire the machine up and see if it's working. However, without a cooler on top, I'm not going to do that. So it looks like we're going to have to go ahead and, and mount the motherboard and hook up, install the cooler, and just hope for the best. Because if it doesn't work, we'll be taking it all back apart again, which I prefer to avoid. And the other thing I want to do before I forget is I'm going to take that little M.2 screw. I want to go ahead and put it where it belongs so that we don't have to try and locate it in the future. I do wish the board just came with that pre-installed. I cannot tell you how many times my customers have no idea where the box is that I tell them to put away. Because you know they're, they, they're doing a repair or an upgrade or they're asking me to do it and I'm asking, where's the box of parts? I need the screws. Uh, you didn't give me a box of parts. And so this, we just, we want to snug it up. We don't want it to come loose. That would be bad times. But don't over tighten it. Just to the point where it doesn't want to turn right there. It's good enough. And do keep in mind, if you want to add another NVMe in the future, this board has that capability. So with that, I think we can go back to camera one. Camera one. There we go. Thank you, camera girl. You're welcome. All right. Does anybody have any questions, concerns that I missed something? I don't, change my don't change your settings. <laughs> I, I'm assuming the dial just got accidentally bumped. It happens. You know, this is a working environment. Stuff's happening. That's how you know work is getting done. Settings are changing. John Williams wants to know if we can mount that NVMe drive on the back instead of the front. So if you wanted to add a drive later, it would be easier to access. Well, this drive in particular, uh, being a Gen 4 drive, you would want, I would highly recommend a heat sink for it. And that rear uh, M.2 slot isn't going to allow for much of a heat sink. So yes, you can. However, um, and I don't know if that's a Gen 4 slot, but I would put a Gen 3 drive back there and I would get one that already has like a paper thin heat sink, something very, very small. Um, they do sell some NVMe drives like uh, A Data comes to mind where they've got what's basically like a, a little sheet of aluminum. It's very, very thin and it won't get in the way of the installation of the board but I wouldn't put Gen 4 back there, nothing fast, because when you're getting that speed, you're generating more heat and you need a way to dissipate the heat. You're gonna to have to sacrifice, if, if you don't have any way to, to uh, diffuse that heat, then your best bet is to stick with something minimal on performance. It's also gonna be less expensive, that's the benefit of that. But yeah, you certainly could, you don't have to use this one up front. The system will boot to either one. You could have them both and put Linux on one and Windows on the other and tell the BIOS which one to boot to. That's another option to consider as well. So very customizable to your individual needs. But I want to take advantage of the best performance for the best price. And so for me, that right now is the Gen 4, specifically these phasing drives. Um, but if I just had a Gen 3 drive lying around, it'd probably be kind of a waste to put it in that slot. Probably be better to put it in the back anyway. We'd have to look at the documentation of the board just to see what Gen, the uh, back M.2 supports. If it supports Gen 3 only, I think that would be a good idea. If it supports Gen 4 and you're buying um, a lower end Gen 4 drive, like the stuff we see pre-installed, from um, manufacturers on pre-built minis and regular PCs. Those are all mid-range and they won't have any heat problems. So if you want speed, you wanna use the front. And if you don't care about speed, then use the back. I guess that's the succinct way to put it. 
And thank you for your question. There's our friend Peter with another super chat contribution. Thank you, Peter. John Henry says, camera girl, superhero. Don't tell her that. She'll, she's going to go get her cape. I want to remind you, you can pull the documentation for this motherboard up. If you simply go to Google and type B650i Lightning, it should offer you ASRock's website, you click on support and then manual, and you can just download the PDF and you can read all about the specifications and details that we don't necessarily have time to get into with the videos that may be, you know, specific to your individual needs. Now, let's go ahead and take this stuff. So once again, this stuff here is gonna go in the motherboard box. anymore. Let me go grab the case. This is interesting because usually we do these in two parts. We usually prep the board first, and that's a full two hours or sometimes three hours just to prep the board. And then it's another two or three hours to get the board mounted into the case and get all the cabling. So in general, you know, depending on how familiar we are with the build, some builds can happen much quicker. However, when I'm working with parts I'm not familiar with, I always, I try to be cautious. I try to take my time and more importantly, try to enjoy myself. I don't want to be stressed out like on some kind of a race. It's how quickly you can build a computer is not important as far as I'm concerned in any technical aspect. I've never, I've never seen a company hire somebody based on how fast they can build a computer. What I have seen are companies that are measuring your weekly or monthly performance overall, like when it comes to repair or building, but not an individual build. Now, if you work in a factory and you're building the same thing over and over and it becomes muscle memory, it's much, much faster. But if you're trying to teach people, you need to slow down, you need to work for the camera, which isn't necessarily giving you the builder a very good angle to see or to work. And that will also slow you down. I recommend you try it sometime. Let me know how it works for you. Especially when you're looking in a camera, everything is backwards. <laughs> and, and you're working so that the camera can see everything and you have to work blind. Then time yourself. It's very different results. Now, we have a number of uh, uh, wire ties here holding cables on, and I wanna get these wire ties out of here. However, before I start loosening up things that might get in our way, I might want to mount the board first. I don't need any loose cables getting trapped under the board. So I'm going to set the case down like this. And all mini ITX motherboards have one screw in each corner. There is no alternative. Therefore, when you're buying a case that is specifically designed for a mini ITX motherboard, the standoff should be pre-installed. There should be one standoff in each corner. There is no deviation from that. So, just so you know. Now, we have our motherboard power cable here tied up and it's gonna be in the way because when I put the board in and I need to secure those screws in each corner, I can't get to that corner or this corner. So, Based on that, I need to get this wire tie removed so I can get these cables out of the way. And I'll keep these wire ties attached so these cables stay out of our way. Whoa, it's all twisted. What is this? This is a four pin CPU, uh, PWM fan header. That is the shortest CPU power cable I've ever seen running from the power supply right here. So said so these, these are custom cut 
power supply cables so that you don't have a bunch of excessive uh, cable management to do. So we want to move everything out of the way. This is our GPU riser. We just, we can't really move that except to push it back, but I want to have access to all four of the standoffs. And then I can take the motherboard here and you notice the way I handle the parts. I don't wear a, an anti-static strap because if I'm carrying any static on me, the only place it's going to dissipate is into the case or anything I'm touching. So remember, um, if you carry a charge on you, most people can't tell until you go to touch something and it goes zap. If the thing you're touching is a grounding area, like such as the metal on the case or the heat sink on the motherboard, or you can see how I'm holding this, that zap won't hurt anything. It might hurt you, <laughs> but be mindful of how you hold the components and pay attention. Even if you need to rewind my video, go back and watch any of my videos going all the way back to 2008 when I started the channel. I have been doing this so long, I don't even think about it. Because I don't think about it, it doesn't always occur to me to mention it to you guys. Pay attention to how I'm holding the parts. If you find that to be too challenging, wear an anti-static strap. Now, I'm going to set the board just down here. And I do what's called a dry fit. And that's where I just want to make sure everything's going to line up, that we have cables out of the way things are going to fit and line up properly. There's a lot of little cables here. Take your time. We have a big bundle of cables in our way right here for some reason. That might have to be moved. You can kind of tell where the struggle is here. As we come around to this side, there is a bundle of cables wire tied here that I might need to remove the wire tie and lift up away because the board is hitting them and the board isn't flexible. Okay. The board's saying, you got to make room for me. I don't make room for you. I am the motherboard, the mother of all boards. You will accommodate me. And so right here on this corner, these cables right here are keeping the board from going down. You don't want to use any force. You could crack the corner of the board and that's going to ruin your whole day. You can also cut in from the edges of the board into the insulation on the cables. And that can create a short circuit in the system when you put it all together and, you know, smoke comes out. That's not good. So let me just take another look here. See if I can move these cables. It appears the wire ties, ah, they're on there really super tight. Okay, I can see that side. We have another cable in the way. Once I moved this, this was our USB 3 front port umbilical here. That was getting in the way as well. So I think, yeah, we're seated now. I can see through the holes on the board. And now we can secure the board down, which is going to require screws that come with the case for this. Those are the only screws you should be using are the ones that come with the case. They will not come with the motherboard. Cases use different screws depending on the manufacturer. So to make sure we're using the right ones. Uh, why am I looking in the motherboard box? I already told you they're not included with the motherboard. But while I've got the box open, let's go ahead and put all the extra stuff in there. The box I want to be looking in is the box that came with the case. As you recall, I set that over there, so I gotta go get it. So this box was included with the case, and that's gonna have all the equipment, tools, screws, uh, accessories that we potentially need for our build. Because we're doing a custom build, there are going to be some parts we use and some parts we don't. There may be some parts that you use that I don't. That's the benefit of a custom build. 
for example, I won't use this. We're not going to extend the case out. But that's not to say the owner of the computer might not want to do that at a later date. These are extra power supply cables. I try and get rid of all the extra packing. It just makes it harder to put things back in the box. There are screws right there. It looks like... Yeah, that looks like what we need. And the rest of this is for the mounting of the cooler. That's why it's in a separate bag. Unfortunately, the bags aren't labeled, so you kind of have to know what you're looking at. Or you can watch this video as a guide. So this bag individual, individually has uh, some nylon zip ties included. That's always a nice touch. It's got a couple of extra standoffs. I'm not sure where those are used. Oh, that's interesting. They're like little thumb screws, and it looks like you could use them as an alternative to secure the board instead of using traditional screws. I had to guess, and I haven't looked at the documentation. Now, they're different thread types. The, the screws have a coarser thread, and whatever these little thumb screws are, they're a finer thread, so they're not for the motherboard. They're for something else. Maybe for the installation of a two and a half inch drive. Those are the kind of uh, thread type that a two and a half inch SSD would use. I don't know. Probably uh, explained in the documentation. Tell anybody I'm looking at the documentation. A lot of pictures. I like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cooler mounting instructions. Oh, well, this cooler is going to use those little plastic brackets after all. Who knew? But I didn't take them off. Video card installation, case expansion instructions. Ah, here we go. Those screws are used to install a two and a half inch SSD. Look at that, 30 years plus of experience and shows I've learned something in that time, doesn't it? There's the, there's the evidence right there. You're like a little thumb screw, which shows you in the corner times four. And that's for mounting the two and a half inch drive. And you can see where that goes there on the case if you're gonna use a two and a half inch drive. Just FYI. These are pretty important, so I am going to put them in the motherboard box so I don't use them. You can download these instructions too by going to Cooler Master's website, look up the Encore 100. You should be able to download the PDF if you want to look through that documentation. If you're curious and you want to learn more, so. See. There's our nylon zip ties. You know what? Those can go in the motherboard box for our cable management. We save that for last. Set them over here. Captain Blinsky, what's Carrie's email to send an Amazon gift card? Uh, you can email me at my name, Carrie at kerryholtman.com. I think Mara can throw that in there. Are you back there, Mara? Can you can you type that in the chat for me? Ah, well, there you go. She was already on top of it. Okay, so let me cut this open. So I guess this little socket right here is for, I don't know what it's for. It's for the motherboard standoffs. It's for nothing in the bag. And the motherboard standoffs are already where they need to be. There's no alternative options unless I guess you 
stripped one out and you damaged it and you need to replace it. I use a five millimeter socket myself. I don't use those, those little Phillips screwdriver sockets that they, look, it's nice that they include these little sockets, but I personally don't use them. I use a proper socket. Now we've got one, two, three, four of these little tiny like thumb screws and that's for a two and a half inch drive install. I'm gonna put those right back in this bag because we're not using a two and a half inch drive on today's build. And they've given us one, two. Oh, these are different. So two screws are also finer thread. So the four, oh, these four screws have to be for the motherboard. The other two screws that at a casual glance, it looks like they gave us six identical, but these two are different. And these would be used for, let me think if I can come up with a reason why you would need two. Um, I would have to go back in the documentation and look. I'm trying to think what takes two screws. These are also finer threads. These aren't the coarse thread screws. We'll put those back in the bag because I don't know what they're used for just yet. And more can also provided the email there. Thank you, more. Okay. So, oh, and that little socket tool that I don't use, I might as well put that back in the bag. Remember, this is not a computer for me. This will go to somebody, and they might want that. Even though I don't value it, they might. It's not my decision to make. So let me grab my screwdriver here, and let's go ahead and secure the board. One screw in each corner. Once again, I strongly recommend you only start these screws. Do not tighten them all the way down until they're all started because you may need to wiggle and adjust the board to get all of the holes to line correctly. That's normal. And if you tighten any of the screws down, then the board won't move properly and you'll have to go back and loosen the screws. So, FYI. Four screws, four mounting holes. Now that they're all started, the order of tightening doesn't matter. Um, tighten until the screws don't turn anymore. These are also something you don't want to over tighten. Once you bring it down and the screw stops moving forward, don't force it any further than that. And make sure you visit all four screws. Don't forget one. And if you're not sure if you forgot one, go back around one more time. Just check to make sure nothing got loose. That one's tight. That's one. That one's tight. That's two. We count them out. We need to reach four. This one's tight. That's three. And that one's tight. That's four. With that, that's how easy it is to install the motherboard in this case. And I'll tell you something that's pretty darn cool if you ask me. Just check this out. Our little CPU power. You've seen me struggle with putting this on some cases where it's, it's up in the top corner and hard to access. Look how short this cable is. And it just plugs in. <laughs> right here. That's it. That's all there was to it. It's on. And then our big motherboard power cable that goes right here. Look at this. It's already cut to the right length, and you just push that on. Power's done. Now, when we come around to the back, one of the things that I think is important to note is that access to that rear M.2 drive, and bear in mind, this is going to vary from motherboard to motherboard, okay? First of all, not all motherboards are going to have a second M.2, and if they do, it may not necessarily be in this position. But if you look back here, and we have some cables in our way, but once we move these cables out of the way, we have a clear cutout access panel to get to the M.2 drive right there. So it would be no big deal, you know, to the earlier question, could we use that one first since the front one is easier to get to? Turns out, you've made an incorrect assumption, or perhaps we all did, in assuming 
that that one would be more difficult to get to. They have accommodated or considered that. I didn't do any research when I bought this motherboard. So I was just looking for the best value board. I wasn't looking to the best board for this case. It turns out this may be the best board for this case. Who knew? Here's the other thing. You know this PCIe riser cable that I talked about that's going to move our PCIe slot, which is right, right down here, right at the very bottom of the board. We can take this riser cable, and it's got a little cover on it here, a little protective dust cover that comes off. And then that exposes the contacts that look like the bottom of a video card. And that just plugs directly into that socket right there, which I can do right now. We just move that into the socket and push straight down. And you'll hear that little locking clip that's on the end of the video card. Lock that connector on. You couldn't ask for that to be any easier. It's done. Now, this mechanism back here that is our GPU slot, it's live and ready to go for us to plug a graphics card in there. Or if I want to put a video capture card in there, whatever I want, go right in there. And it's three slots wide. I think that's another important consideration. Bearing in mind, though, you don't really have any airflow this way. So if your video card is like most, if it's got those axial fans, it's blowing air this way. It's just going to hit this plate. So a really high-end graphics card may have thermal issues in here. This cable right here is a uh, the new graphics card power cable style. I forget what that's called. And this will support up to 400. It will deliver up to 450 watts, it says right on it. I forget the name of this cable. I'm sure someone in chat will remind me. And if we're not going to use it, is it modular? Can we take it out? Yes, we can remove it. Put it in the box. And there's one less cable in our case. And that's why they gave us the other cable. If you've got an older card that doesn't use the newer style power connector, you can go either way with that. Pretty, pretty cool. Getting pretty far along in the build. It's only it's less than two hours of today's video. And we've already got CPU and storage installed. The motherboard's installed in the case. We still have our front I.O. and, of course, our liquid cooler to install. So for us, when we're done, this side is going to remain pretty empty for me personally. It is really designed for a GPU to go in there, but you don't have to. And that's why I selected the GPU that I did. It's only a 65 watt CPU and it's got integrated GPU in it. Call it an APU. So call it a, an IGP, an integrated graphics processor. It has a number of different. Intel, I think, calls it G, IGP and AMD, I think, calls it APU, advanced processing unit. Anyway, when you're buying your CPU, if you intend on using integrated graphics, some CPUs have integrated graphics, some do not. Pay attention to which CPU you're buying. If you're intending on using a discrete graphics card, you can save a little money by buying a CPU that does not have integrated graphics, but the benefit from having it anyway is for diagnostics. If you're having problems to have a secondary card, you can fall back on. But if that's not important to you, you can save about 30 bucks by buying a CPU that does not have integrated graphics, just so you know. Nick Caffrey says that's quite an impressive combo, don't you think? Well, I like that it's different, and I like how easy it goes together. I think if you've never built a mini ITX computer before, this takes a lot of the work out of it for you, specifically the cabling. Um, everything's very easy, and the fact that I can open the whole case up without a screwdriver is a nice touch. The fact that it's a different color, it's not black or white, you know, it's this bronze color, is a nice option to have. 
Um, I like that the USB ports are down below so that we're not hanging a drive like with some tower cases where the USB ports are kind of in the middle. You would have to plug like a USB drive in and drive, you know what I'm talking about, it hangs there, which is fine. It's just not ideal. It doesn't look like a computer. Um, but so far, like I said, when I, when I first saw that the price of this case was $400, I was a little put off by it. But then when I saw it included an 850 watt modular power supply and a 120 millimeter all-in-one cooler, and then it's all custom cut to fit the case, then my only concern at that point was what happens when the cooler needs to be replaced? What do you do? No idea. Joseph wants to know if I have a GPU card. So we're not hanging a, I'm gonna read this out loud and this is why it's important that sometimes you might be anxious when you wanna say something. And I recommend you read what you wrote out loud to yourself because here's what it sounds like. And I'm not quite sure I can make sense of this. Do you have a GPU card to in the so? We're not hanging a with some tower cases. Show us what it would fit. Um, it'll fit pretty much any GPU. As far as I can tell, any GPU at all. I don't, I'm not aware of a GPU that won't fit in here. So you should have no anxiety or concern about that. I would advise you, however, to not put anything too extreme in here because of the potential thermal issues. There are some other videos that will, you know, that have got builds and they'll use whatever GPUs they decide to use. But I think it's important that people know that they don't have to. See, if you're a regular computer user and you're watching these build videos, they're primarily done by hobbyists and extremist enthusiasts. And if you didn't know any better, you'd think you have to buy a GPU because very rarely will anybody show a build without adding this potentially unnecessary component. But they don't necessarily disclose that. So if you don't know much about computers and you're just starting and you're learning and you're thinking about building one, it's very easy for you to assume you're gonna to have to buy a GPU when if you're not a gamer or you don't have some specific purpose for needing that ex the discrete graphics, you may not be aware that the hobbyists and the enthusiasts are building something over the top. And the reason why they're making videos is because they're hobbyists and enthusiasts. They're not average folks making these videos, at least not the popular ones. So when I do my videos, I like to do them differently and I like them to more closely represent what I do in my business. It is not very often that I have a real world client calling and ordering a machine for gaming. 95, 96% of the systems I sell, those are all going to businesses and they're ordering, you know, a half dozen computers that, you know, the businesses that I provide computers to aren't just buying one. And so they really need to get the price down and they don't want to buy what they don't need. And they also don't want to spend more than they have to spend. And we also don't want to have to support more. And if we add more parts, that's more parts that can fail. That's more drivers that have to be updated. Um, it, it's just inconvenient for everybody. Gaming is an expensive luxury, and there's more than enough video content available showcasing builds with video cards in them. But for the rest of us, for the other 90 some odd percent of computer owners out there, I'd like to emphasize to you that as long as you buy a graphic, uh, a CPU with integrated graphics, you would be hard pressed to know any difference between the two aside from the $600 plus dollar dent it makes in your wallet. And for the gamers, most of the time they already know, you know which graphics cards they want to use or can afford for the games that they play under the settings that they play them. So I kind of feel that the enthusiasts have already got that covered. We don't, we don't need to repeat that here. But do bear in mind that you have the space here that you could, if you choose to, put a GPU in, and it is built specifically to accommodate for that. 
So when I'm done with this, this whole half of this computer is not being, or this case is just going to be empty for us. And all that's going to mean is better airflow, uh, easier cable management, and a quieter computer and a less expensive one. As far as any way that we use this computer, whether for video editing, for uh, surfing the web, answering emails, watching YouTube videos, we don't need to spend money on a discrete graphics card for that. We're just wasting money. So there you go. You can pretty much put any graphics card in there you want. To the best of my knowledge, they all fit. You just might have thermal issues, some of the bigger, higher-end cards. And, of course, the power limitation of this power supply at 450 watts uh, should also be something you consider. All right, so as far as installing our water block now, I think we can get to that. Let's grab the cooler installation parts. Let's move this over here so you guys can see the beauty of that. This piece, this was the extra. Okay, so we're going to have installation parts for both uh, AMD and Intel in this bag, so we're not going to use everything. I would hope not. Hopefully the bags are labeled to tell us which is which, otherwise we'll have to look through the documentation. So first and foremost, we've got these plastic back plates here. We have two of them. I'm gonna assume these are both for Intel. This is for Intel socket 1700, and this would be for Intel everything else. Then we have these metal brackets here, which I also assume are going to be for Intel. Then we have these funky looking metal brackets that have clips on them that uh, hook onto the plastic around the CPU on our AMD CPU. They're very distinctive. And that's even though they're not, I don't see any labeling that says AMD. Only AMD uses these lockdown clips. So we're definitely going to need these. Now, I don't know if there's a difference with socket AM4 and AM5, but they only give us one set. So I'm going to guess no. We've got this little bag with four screws here. And that's likely going to be to secure these, these metal brackets I just showed you to the bottom of the water block. And I'll bring this little bag up to show it to you. Right here. Remember, I'm doing all this without looking at any documentation. So I'm making some assumptions. And as we progress through this live unscripted video, we'll make corrections if need be. But I'm doing my best with 30 plus years of experience to just visually see it in my head how it's all going to go together so then that these two items here would be needed for amd and i think these standoffs and these thumb screws are likely all i think that's all intel i think all of this is intel and these amd is the easiest one and there doesn't seem to be a difference for socket am4 or am5 which is interesting very interesting. So I'm going to take all this. We'll put that back in here because I don't, don't think we need it. John Paul Bacon confirms AM5 is AM4 cooler compatible. Well, that explains that. So in theory, all we have to do is attach these brackets to this pump with these screws and then attach the pump onto the CPU and secure the clips down, pump's installed. That's way easier. I'm accustomed to working on Intel and that's much, much easier than most Intel chips. Some Intel chips, like the, uh, the Xeon series, the, the X, the chips that have the X in the name, those you can screw right down to the backplate on the CPU. Those are like the easiest to install, even easier than this. So, they're also very, very expensive chips, and this cooler would not cool them. All right, let's get these out of the bag. 
We're just at the two hour mark. Let's see if we can't get this at least fired up before we wrap it up for today. Because I would like to see if the CPU is recognized. I assume it will be. If not, we'll have to do the BIOS flashback thing. But now that we have experience doing it, I'm not worried if we have to. I don't think we're going to have to. But, but we, we can also see if, even if it's booting up, that there isn't still yet a newer BIOS available anyway. So let me get rid of this plastic. And let's see here. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Let me bring that up to the camera for those of you not familiar. This is going to hook onto the tabs on the plastic pieces that are around the CPU contact frame that I said, you know, that we left in. And then this piece <clears throat> is going to attach to the bottom of the water block. So when the water block is sits, sits down on this, then this hooks onto the plastic piece. And as we tighten this, it brings the tension up to make sure that that water block is right up against the surface of the internal heat spreader of the CPU. The tighter that is, the better our heat transfer. And you're going to want to tighten both sides again evenly, or you could end up, if you tighten one side first and then the other side, you may end up with the water block sitting cattywampus, and you cannot see that with the naked eye. You'll see it when your machine overheats and you can't figure out why. It's because you didn't tighten the screws down evenly. So this should be super easy to install. Let me just take a look here. We've got a wire tie that's got to come off. But this has been one of the easiest builds I've done in a long time, and I don't expect easy and mini ITX to go in the same sentence. So kudos to Cooler Master. Let's go ahead and take this one off too, because I want to have full freedom of movement here. But we'll leave the, the front board umbilicals, we'll leave those wire tied out of the way. And then this is our cooling fan for the radiator. And then we have the other power cable for the rear case fan. And then this fan is to power the pump. Now, if your motherboard has a header that says CPU fan, and then next to that, it says AIO or all in one. The difference between those is that a fan will get lesser voltage or more voltage to spin slower or faster to react to the heat of the system. But if you're using a water block, you want your pump running full speed at all times. It should not be wavering voltage. So at the very least, if you only have a CPU fan header on your board and you're plugging a pump into it, there's usually a setting in the BIOS where you say on the CPU fan that it's in the pump setting, which means it's gonna run full voltage and it won't waver the voltage regardless of the system temperature. That's something else that could result where the, the you've got it plugged into a fan header and the system's running nice and cool. So it's sending less voltage to slow the fan down and then your pump's not running at full speed and then your system's getting hot and you're scratching your head going, I thought water pumps were better than this. And that means you just didn't configure it correctly. So just an FYI, something to be aware of. Now, let me see how these go on here. It looks like... These go on underneath. Again, without looking at documentation, I just sort of gauging it here. Which way does it go? Well, it can't go on that. This way. Oh, there's a notch cut out. Interesting. Okay. So on, so again, without looking at the documentation, if you pay attention to the details, it should be pretty obvious. There is a little notch cut right here. See that notch? And this is going to fit around a piece of plastic of that shape. It's either on the top of the block or below the block. That keeps this from moving around. And in this case, it's on the top of the block because I was curious as I'm looking at it, just trying to determine from logic, 
you know, if this piece goes on this way, you know, on the top, or if it would go on underneath, because we could in theory make it work either way. But there is a little notch cut out, and I can see it, and it makes the answer to my question uh, pretty obvious, I think. And I'm going to guess that the screws are going to go on from underneath, that we're going to go up instead of down, based, again, just looking at it visually without looking at documentation, just kind of reverse engineering it in my mind. And I'm going to try that and see if it works. Because to me, that's way more fun than reading the, the walkthrough sheets. I want to cheat. I encourage you to read the documentation. It's working. It's working. So I'm just putting these screws on from the bottom through the plastic here on the bottom of the pump and up into the bracket. We do want to make sure these are pretty secure. There's Andy Kane joining us. Welcome in, Andy. That looks good. And then we'll do the exact symmetrical opposite here. making sure that those little square doodads are coming down this way towards the bottom of the block, obviously where the clips are. If they were, if I turn these upside down, it wouldn't do as much good if the thumb screws <laughs> are facing the motherboard. So a lot of this should be common sense if you really look at it. But don't be afraid to look at the documentation. I just kind of make a, a game out of that. I pride myself on being able to do, uh, figure things out on my own. Sometimes I'm more successful than others. That's okay. It, it adds to the fun. Would help if I had three hands. This plastic's a little in the way here. Okay, nice and tight. Nice and tight. Now, in theory, this once we put some thermal compound on it. I can move this so I can see it. This will go on which way? That way. One like this. Oh, yeah. All right, so to do this part, I need to lay the case flat to work with gravity. They've included some thermal compound here, but <laughs> this always cracks me up. Let me bring this over to the camera and show you. Does that look, that looks like there's a lot of thermal compound in there, doesn't it? <laughs> but there's a sticker. I, I wonder why the sticker's there. What if we peel the sticker away? Let's see how much thermal compound they've given us. I, I hope you're sitting down. Are you ready? This is brand new out of the box. We've never used it. Just peel the sticker away. Boy, that sticker's on good. There's the plunger. So the spot between the bottom of the plunger and the nozzle, that's how much compound they've given us. And the rest of this is all empty. What do you think of that, Mara? 
right? $400 for this and they can't give me a little extra? They just, that's all you need. Don't screw up because you don't have anything else. That's pretty much one application if you're lucky. Look at, well, if you do it right, look at this. I see that, yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing they gave us a tube this big. Right. Because, you know, it needs... Well, you know, fingers. Well, I guess a smaller... Yeah, but you know, if they were more honest... Right? Wouldn't this be a little more honest? Why can't... Look. Why do they use this, right, that takes up all the room in the landfill, when they could have used this? Is this not big enough to hold that little teeny tiny amount that's in there? This one's not full either, if we peel the tape back, but it's not so insulting. This, you know, can you imagine if they didn't wrap that with tape, what kind of feedback they would get from the uh, buyers? But people don't think to peel it back and look. You will feel it, you know, when you push the plunger down, it bottoms out real quick. But that's normal. So, but it's not just Cooler Master. Everybody does it. Even Noctua. Okay, so now, pump time. So we'll use their uh, <laughs> pittance of compound here. Read that on there. Oh, you know what? There may be enough for two applications in here, as long as it's not a thread ripper. And I will grab my nitrile glove. Am I saying that right? Nitrile? Nitrile? Nitrile. These are powder-free. Not rubber, not latex. Nitrile, powder-free. They're not sanitary. They're just clean. Um, yeah, it's clean. And then I'm going to use my finger to spread the thermal compound. And this compound is very dry. Yikes. Hey, can you, can you come here with the close-up camera? I want to show something here. I can't shoot. <laughs> You ready? Ready. Come on over. I want you to take a look at the thermal compound here. See if you can get a nice close-up of that. This should be kind of liquidy. Oh, my God. You see how dry it is? Wow, that's not good. So not only did they not give us much of it, and so this case only came out last month, this is very, very old oh, thermal compound. Cool. So you don't want to use this. Um, let me rephrase. I don't want to use this. I'm going to throw the rest of this tube in the trash can. When it gets old, it dries out. This is already dry. When normally, when I'm spreading thermal compound, you should just see it. It's like I'm painting. It's, it's almost like the viscosity of paint. And I cover the entire surface. But I'm going to clean that now. And uh, we're going to use a different thermal compound. What a shame. You could ruin your whole build with that because they cheaped out. At least we're not wasting much. There's not much in the tube. All right, you're good. Thank you for the close-up. Yes. Yeah, it's super easy to work on. So there you go. All right, so I am going to grab, uh, I guess, a paper towel to wipe off the bulk of that, and then we'll get some isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip to just clean it off because we want our surface to be super clean to allow for the best possible heat transfer. So the heat's gonna transfer even on a dirty surface, don't get me wrong. It'll just transfer better, clean surface. Since it's a new build, I'd like it to transfer heat as much as it's capable. So something to be aware of and to look for is that's definitely not right. And thermal compounds cheap. There's no reason for them to include old inventory like that and to be so chintzy with it. That's that's a big strike against Cooler Master.
So we're just using this uh, isopropyl alcohol and just want to clean off the surface of the CPU here for anything that remains from that old stuff. Once again, you don't have to do this. Simply doing your best to wipe it clean and then put the new stuff on will be adequate, but this is, if you can, this will be better. Okay, and just let that air dry. The alcohol will evaporate. You don't need to wipe it dry. Unless you used way too much. Okay, thermal compound. Let's see what we got to choose from here. I'm watching that evaporate. It's still, it's drying as we speak. Okay, we have some Noctua though. See, this is a brand new tube of Noctua. And this is the stuff you can buy from like Amazon, the NTH1. And it tells you there's 3.5 grams in here, but that doesn't really, unless you can visualize 3.5 grams, this tube looks like it would hold about 20 grams if I had to guess. They don't tell me the size of the tube. So once again, if we peel away the tape, we've already got more than we had. So let's say you went to Amazon and you bought one of these tubes. This is what 3.5 grams, because this is brand new. We've never used this. That's what 3.5 grams looks like. You still see two thirds of this tube is empty. It's not like this stuff expands and they're doing it for safety. It's, it's purely there to make you think you're getting more than you've actually got. But at least that sticker peels off nice and clean. And now I'm left with a syringe that has no label on it. So in the future, I'll be like, gee, was that the Noctua stuff or was that the extra stuff from, yeah, I don't know. That looks good and dry, so we can go ahead and apply this now. Now, to show you the difference, let's get Mara back here with the... Um, Close-up camera, I want you to see how this spreads differently. And we're gonna use another, a clean glove. We don't wanna use or contaminate our thermal compound with another thermal compound. Do not mix your thermal compounds. Bad, bad, bad. Okay, and let's go to sub camera. Okay, come on over. So you see I put a, a little blob there. And we're just going to take that and you see how this is much more liquidy. Notice it's not tearing. And it's just like finger painting. And that's what it should feel like. It's like a thick paint. And you'll see I'm getting a little bit there on the contact frame, but I'm trying to get it evenly. If you put the blob down and you just squish it down, then you've got more faith than I do that that's going to spread evenly. Because there are chips all underneath this heat sink, it's not like the old days where the, heat, the chip was like only in the middle and you didn't have to worry about the edges. So for me, because I warranty my systems and I'm the one whose name goes behind it, if there's a problem, it makes me look bad. I follow my own rules and um, I tap on it to create these little hills and valleys. And I don't know if you can adjust that camera at all. It's really reflecting the light bad. Can you tilt the camera forward? And let's try a zoom. That's much better. So you see the little hills and valleys I made? And ignore my little nest there. Once we put the block on, you're not going to see it. Um, if you try and clean that, it'll just smear and get worse. So just <laughs> be lucky. That's all it is. Count your blessings. And then while you're there, we should be able to then take our water block we need to remove this plastic. That's keeping this bottom surface that's polished, free from any dust or fingerprints, again, for the best thermal transfer. Now we could cover this in dust and fingerprints and it's still gonna work. It just won't work as well, okay? So it's kind of optional. Now this is gonna go down this. 
Now, normally the hoses go out towards where the ram sockets are. When you're watching people build, if they're building it right, if they're following the normal procedures, these, these lines coming off the block are normally right along the same side as the ram. So I'm gonna set this down. Oh, let's make sure that these can lock this down onto here. Bring this end down. Okay, now it's kind of being held in. Now these thumb screws, as we tighten them, yeah, want to kind of tighten them evenly here, back and forth. Because if you tighten one more than the other, this, why doesn't this feel like it's tightening? Am I missing this? Oh, I think I have to push down on it. This side is way down further. And see there's a hole in the top of this? That's where that is supposed to thread through. Put it in correctly. It has to line up with the threads or it's not going to tighten down. So in this case, I need to really loosen the other side here because the more I tighten the other side, the harder this side is to get started. Yikes. That seems like it fit now. Now I have the opposite problem. So now I need to loosen this side. <laughs> just not too much, right? There should be good. And there I just, there we go. You've got to move the pump around until the pump sits flat. And it's there's a lot of things for the pump to get hung up on around this socket here. And so when it's when it's not sitting flat, these won't turn. So you need to adjust and twist this. Now that it's started, now we're gonna just go ahead and tighten each side down more or less evenly. You can kind of visually see just how tight each one is. This one's clearly not down as far. Now they look pretty even. And I'm just gonna Turn this this way for you guys to see. I'm just going to go back and forth on these. You know, you notice there's no tools for this. They don't want you tightening it that tight. If you can't turn it any further with your fingers, then that's as tight as they want you to go. But I will tighten it as tight as I can get it. Block is installed. Now the block needs power. And if we look up here on the top of the board, we have very fine writing. And this will be detailed in the motherboard manual in not so microscopic writing. But it says right here, I'll read it to you. It's very small font right above here. And this says CPU fan one. And then the next header over says CPU fan two or some letters there. I think it says all in AIO. Let me grab my flashlight. Again, the documentation will make this much easier to read, but it is written right above the connector. It says WP for water pump. Since this is a water pump, we will plug it in there. Thank you, camera girl. You're welcome. Shadows. Well, uh, that's what happens when we bring in extra light. And let me go back to camera one. There we go. Okay.
So just we just need to hook up the uh, the rear case fan, the radiator fan, put our RAM in. We really don't even need to hook up all the front port umbilicals, just the power switch, and we can fire this bad boy up. So, back to my glaces. When it comes to these fans, let me get these out of the way first. We've got this fan header for our rear case fan. And I hope our motherboard supports all these fans. So we have a CPU fan header. We have one more fan header down on the bottom. So it looks like this motherboard only supports three fan headers. So what that tells me is the radiator fan. We'll plug that into where we would normally use a CPU fan because that's kind of our CPU fan. Right there. And I'll, I'll clean this cable up a little bit later. I just want to see if everything works. And then this fan, we only have one fan header left and it's all the way down here, unfortunately. So there's no real easy cable path for that to hide it. But again, this case doesn't have any windows. So I suppose there's that blessing. But we can still, you know, make an effort later when it's all done and working. We can try and figure out another way to route this cable where it's less visual. Because this motherboard only gives us these three fan headers. There is no more fan headers to use. That's it. We are, we are out. So if we wanted to add any more fans, if that were even possible, we would need a uh, fan splitter for that, which again adds to the table mess. So I highly discourage fan splitters unless you have a bigger case. Um, as far as our umbilicals go, go, we have all of the umbilicals wire tied here against the side of the case. And of course, we still have to put RAM in, but the RAM will go in super easy. So here, by taking these two wire ties off, also in the back, they have wire tied. And this is the worst place for wire ties to be. But they've wire tied this whole uh, PCIe cable into a bundle. And there are two wire ties back here. And I'm going to strongly recommend if you're building in this that you use the enclosed or provide your own nylon zip ties and just put the nylon zip ties where these are. Take these out of your system. In time, these wire ties, they dry out, they become brittle. And when they become brittle, they break apart. And so by moving the computer, simply moving the computer, it, the broken metal inside of the wire ties can ground out against any of these solder points against the back of the board. And it can fry your whole system. Your whole system can be completely toasted beyond repair because you couldn't be bothered to take these wire ties out earlier. If a nylon zip tie gets dried out and it breaks, it's just plastic. There won't be any um, conductivity if it should touch anything metal. So I can't emphasize enough that before we, we're done with the build, when we're doing cable management, anywhere you see a wire tie, remove it. And if you need something there, use a nylon zip tie instead. Now with these cables, wire ties removed, we should be able to pull them away and see what we've got. HD audio, front panel. Oh, the front panel is all one connector. Hey, that's a move from NZXT. That's the power switch, reset switch, power LED, hard drive LED, all in one connector, except there's not eight wires, there's only four. So that tells me we have no hard drive LED and no reset switch. What we have is a power switch, that's two wires, and a power LED, that's two wires. Even though the connector has nine holes, we're only using four of them. But that makes plugging it in super easy because on these little mini ITX boards, a lot of times, this front panel connector is up around the power connector here. 
Where did they put it on this board? So on this board, it's right next to <laughs> it's right next to a front port USB. They're very similar and they're right next to each other. I think the designers of this board aren't doing you any favors by putting those right next to each other. But the good news is you cannot fit the USB connector on the front panel header, nor can you fit the front panel header on the USB because the pin that's blocked is different in a different position. So you can't, you can't really get it wrong even if you wanted to. So here it looks like Hold on a second. I need the flashlight because I might have just set it backwards because it's looking like this will only go on the uh, connector closest to the edge of the board, which I thought was the USB. Yeah, I got it backwards. So because they're right next to each other, like I said, you, you can't, you cannot get it wrong. The connector simply won't go on. So, and the only one this is going to fit on this way is the one closest to the edge of the board right there now i don't want to crowd this area up too much because i still got to put the ram in but we still have our hd audio to hook up our usb 3.1 that's our type c and our usb 3 those are the three remaining cables but we don't need those hooked up to test the system what i do need is ram so let's put the ram in and let's fire it up get the show on the road now to put the ram in once again i'm going to set the case down like this so I can use gravity to assist me in pushing the RAM into the socket properly. Nothing worse than thinking you have your RAM seated and your system won't turn on and you can't figure out why. And it's because you didn't set the system down, you tried doing it while it was upright, and you just couldn't get the leverage you needed. And you thought it was in the socket, but it wasn't. Ask me how I know. Ooh, shiny. I got shiny RAM that no one will ever see. Make sure that's in right, and then we'll push down and then down. Okay. Same thing with the other remaining. No, no, it's not much to see here. Uh, goes in no differently than any other RAM I've shown 4,000 times before. All done. Blinked, you missed it. That's 32 gigs of RAM. And let's see, we'll move that over here. Let's grab a let's grab a keyboard and a mouse. Now, if I want to use these USB ports down here, I've got to hook up this connector. And it's gonna go just right here. Ain't no thing. And then our front port audio, where's that going? Yikes. That goes all the way by the I.O. panel. All the way over here. I wasn't going to hook these up, but it's so easy. I mean, why not? Just need to be able to see. I have. And then our USB Type C, uh, that's going to be right there. Doing this so that, you know, you guys can kind of get an idea of where I'm going on the board. Normally, I would not be plugging cables in <laughs> with the motherboard facing towards you. That's a bizarre way to do it. In fact, it may not be possible. Here we go. Okay. 
can work without seeing what I'm doing. That's an impressive skill, if you ask me. Okay. Now, if I take the keyboard and mouse dongle and plug it down here, you can test to make sure that works. And then we need power and HDMI. I'm not going to plug the internet into this because we don't yet have an operating system. So we'll grab our HDMI and we'll use our onboard video. And then I need a power cable. And we're going to plug that. Notice they've got a custom extension, basically. Our power supply is way up here, right? There's our power supply. But the plug power in way down here. Pretty clever. So power, HDMI, keyboard and mouse. We should be able to fire this up. Now, who thinks this is not going to work? It's possible if we don't have the latest BIOS that it doesn't recognize this chip, although this chip's been out for a while. Does anybody think it's not going to boot up? This is the time to place your bets. All right, here we go. I'm going to move us over to our HDMI input. Now put the camera in the corner. So, and, oh, there's no master on-off switch, is there? Like a normal tower has the on-off on the power supply. I don't think this power supply has an on-off on it. It's interesting. I don't see any switch there, there, or there. Can't see the top without taking it out. So I have to assume if it has a switch, it's in the on position. I have to assume there is no on-off switch on this power supply. What happens when we hit the button? Hey, rear fan is turning. CP, uh, power supply fan is turning. The pump is lit up. Now, because this is our first boot, we need to allow up to two minutes for it to train the RAM and the processor and then save those settings and reboot. So if you see the system switch off and back on, that is normal. In fact, even if it did it two or three times, it's nothing to freak out about. That's part of the first boot process in some cases. Regardless, and I can't emphasize this enough, it doesn't power on right away. That's after we get through this process, then it'll start powering on much faster. It's something easily forgotten if you don't build computers very often. You go to turn it on and just nothing happens. But here's the other thing, not to give you anxiety, but if the CPU we're using is not identified by the BIOS, then after three minutes, it'll still be this. Nothing will happen. It, it says, I don't know what that CPU is. And so it can't proceed to train the CPU. It doesn't identify it. It doesn't recognize it. And for that, a BIOS update would be necessary. Now, the way you would update the BIOS, as I mentioned earlier, is that you would either put an older uh, AM5 socketed CPU in there, boot to that and update the BIOS with the older CPU in place. Or this motherboard has a BIOS flashback button on the back that enables you to flash the BIOS without a CPU or RAM. Now, a lot of places will tell you to take the CPU and RAM out, but I don't believe you have to. I believe you can do it with or without um, the CPU or RAM installed. Now, given how much time this has taken and that we haven't seen any activity, I, I have to assume that it's not recognizing the CPU. The other question, uh, Tony in the chat room is asking if the 7800X3D has built-in graphics, right? Because that's definitely a feature that you want to look for if you intend on not using a graphics card. Now, you see how long we've been waiting, and we just now saw some activity. So I believe to answer your question, we have internal graphics on this chip. It's something I specifically checked on. But I want you to look at the time. This is why we have a benefit doing this live that you're not going to get anywhere else. Well, very rarely will you see people do this live. You can look at the exact time when I push that button to the exact time that you saw activity. And you can tell me exactly how long that took. 
because it felt like a long time, right? It's like heart stopping. Your imagination starts running. Could it be a BIOS? Does the CPU have integrated graphics? This is a sheer sign that you have anxiety. And I ensure that this kind of impatience is not healthy for computer building. You do need to remain patient and you, the panic is no good. It doesn't benefit anybody. By looking at the exact amount of time in this example, then you have firsthand experience right along with me that that is normal and reason to not um, exhibit that level of anxiety. Now, as you can see, we booted into the BIOS. And if I close out camera one, we can get a better look at what BIOS version we have here and look at those details. So let me go full screen on my side here. And we can verify it sees our processor correctly. And it says our BIOS version is 1.28. Now I believe the latest BIOS version is 2.02. .02. We can update the BIOS right now if we want to. We don't have to. When I build computers, I always like to install the latest BIOS update for my customers because I don't know what the BIOS update's fixing. If my customer, let's say that I do not update this BIOS and my customer calls me with a problem after they've had the computer delivered, I'm now going out on a warranty call. If the resolution to the customer's problem is resolved in a BIOS update, I could avoid that warranty call and that inconvenience to my customer by putting the BIOS update on now. So instead of waiting until I need the BIOS update, I assume I need it today and I put it on there to ensure that I will not need it or my customer won't need it in the future. That's the way I look at it from a business standpoint is I don't want my customers inconvenienced and I don't want the cost of the support call that interferes with my ability to earn money. I can't make money from support calls. They only cost money. And if the customer's pissed off enough at the inconvenience, even though you remedied the problem for them, they still may think twice before they order another computer from you. So instead of waiting until I need a BIOS update, I put on the latest so that I won't need it later. But what you choose to do is entirely up to you. I'm not suggesting that my way is right for all people. It's simply how I run my business and the reason why. Desi wants to know if I can do a remote BIOS update. Sometimes it depends on what the issue is and whether or not the manufacturer has a system utility that allows for a BIOS update. In most cases, it's unwise to do it remotely only because you're not there if something goes wrong and then then you're in a real world of hurt where you've taken a bad situation and you've made it worse. So in some cases it's possible, but I, I highly discourage it because you're not there to watch it. So when the BIOS update kicks in, you lose remote access until it's done. And if anything happens, you're not there to see it. So if smoke starts billowing out of the computer, you're remote, you can't see it. Or if something's not looking right or sounding right, you can't see it or hear it. So. Well, you can. I don't think you should. However, it's up to you. If, the, if that's a risk you want to take, uh, it's certainly not a risk I take. Now, what I'm going to do, let's go back over to camera one here, and we're going to wrap up today's video here after we update the BIOS. We're going to do a standard BIOS update, and the way that we do that is here on the streaming computer, I'm going to open up a browser, and we're going to go to the support page for this ASRock motherboard. So I'm going to go to Google. I'm going to type in B650i. You can follow along with me. Lightning BIOS. And the first page that pops up, if you're using Google, should be ASRock's homepage for this motherboard, which I'm now clicking on. When this page comes up, you're going to see, um, eventually, if the page comes up, I think we got a package. Okay, let me refresh the page.
Now, there's always two support areas here. There's a support usually up top, and there's a support down below. The support down below is for this board, okay? So we're gonna go to support down below, and you'll see the option for BIOS right here. So for under BIOS, you see it's got version 2.02, .02, and then 2.06 is a beta, and I don't want the beta. So right here, you'll see there's the instant flash, the BIOS flashback, which we exhibited and demonstrated on the MSI motherboard. I don't think we've done one on ASRock yet. But essentially, if you follow the same procedure that we showed with MSI, that's what we would use if the CPU was not being recognized. Since the CPU is recognized, we can just go to our global download here, and we're going to download a zip file. Then I'm going to grab a flash drive here out of my drawer. I use a very small flash drive, usually two or four gig capacity. And let me go back over to camera one. one. Here we go. And so I have these cheap flash drives that I use for BIOS flashing. I've got a, a bunch of them. For about $2.50 a piece when you buy 10. And I'm going to plug that here into the streamer because remember, we're using the streamer to download the files because we don't have that ability yet on here. So I'm going to just plug this in in the back. Don't mind me. And it's a blank flash drive. I always use a blank flash drive so I don't accidentally pick the wrong file to flash. And then in my downloads directory, I'm going to find that zip file I just downloaded and extract it over to the zip drive. In this case, we just have one file, and it's a .rom file. And I'm going to just go ahead and copy that right there onto the blank flash drive. So we just copy and paste. It's a small file. It's only going to take 10 seconds to copy that over. Now that it's copied over, I'm going to safely eject the uh, flash drive. And this has our latest BIOS on it. Ah, first day with the new feet. There's a lot of stuff on the floor over here and I'm trying to step around it. Take our flash drive now with our extracted BIOS from the zip file and plug it into any of the USB ports back here. Doesn't matter which one. I would avoid. Actually, I would avoid these orange ones. I don't know what those are for. Oh, those are actually high speed ports. That's fine. So, any of the USB ports is fine. And then we're going to go back over to this machine's um, output. So, let me bring that output back up here. Here we go. And I have to go full screen so I can see it. There, now I can see it the way you guys see it. Up here under tool, we're gonna to look for a, a flash tool. Right here, it says instant flash, click that. Notice, please suspend BitLocker and any encryption or security relying on the TPM. Make sure that you've already stored and backed up the recovery key for BitLocker. If the recovery key is missing, while well encryption is active, the data will stay encrypted and the system will not boot into the operating system. It is highly recommended to disable the FTPM before updating the BIOS. Otherwise, an unpredictable failure may occur. One of the benefits of doing this before we install the operating system is this doesn't apply to us. We, the encryption is part of the operating system if you enable it. And since we haven't installed the operating system, we can't possibly have encrypted anything. Therefore, this warning means nothing to us. So under continue, we click yes. Now it automatically finds, without me having to tell it, it finds the flash file all by itself. When you think about it, with the NVMe drive we installed being unformatted with no partition, there's nothing for it to see. And there is no other storage device for it to look at other than the flash drive. So it's kind of obvious when you think about it. So this is our file, it's version 2.02, .02, and that's the, exactly what we've extracted from the zip file we downloaded. Click the update button. It says, after you press yes, the system will automatically reboot. Please wait a few seconds and the BIOS update will continue. Do you wanna update the UEFI to this version? Yes, and leave it alone. At this point, you don't wanna to touch the keyboard, the mouse, you don't wanna cut power. The system will turn itself off, which is what it's just done. That's why it says no signal. 
then it turns itself back on again, just like it said it was going to, it's rebooting. And you may even hear the clicking of the power supply as it engages and disengages power from the board. As it starts up, now it will start to flash the BIOS, hands off, don't touch it. <laughs> it does say warning, system firmware is being updated. The keyboard is locked. Do not turn the power off. Once the firmware update is completed, the system will automatically reboot. So pretty much get up and walk away if you're somebody who's antsy or has anxiety. Don't sit here and watch this because I don't want you to interfere with it. It will automatically restart itself and take us back into the BIOS when it's done. Now, if you've already installed your operating system, it'll take you back into the operating system when it's done. Because we don't have an operating system, it doesn't have a choice when it reboots. The only place it can go is to the BIOS. There's nothing else for it to boot to. So you can safely walk away. If you want, you could turn the monitor off and go to bed. And even though this only takes a couple minutes, it will patiently wait indefinitely for you to return. And it won't harm the system at all. If you come back in 27 days, it'll still be waiting for you. So it's not important that you're right there immediately as soon as it's done. Because if you act too quickly and it actually hasn't finished yet, you could brick your motherboard. So it's very easy to just leave it alone and you're probably going to be just fine. Okay, I think I can get another Gatorade while I'm, working, while I'm waiting. What a clean system. I can't get over how, how simple that was to put together. How often do we get a motherboard built, prepped, and in the case, in one show? Now, granted, I like to keep the shows around two hours, but it's not uncommon for Mitch and I to go three hours just on the motherboard prep. So I got to hand it to Cooler Master with everything except that thermal compound. Um, the installation of the cooler was easy. Installing the board was easy. All the cabling being there for us. The fact that I did not have to put the cooler in, that I did not have to put the power supply in, saved me work and making sure I'm getting compatible parts. Um, very happy with this. Once again, because we showcase our videos live, unscripted and unedited, you're seeing in real time how long this takes. If you're one of those people that can't be bothered to see how long stuff takes, then I just don't want to be you when you're trying to do this on your own and you couldn't be bothered to figure out what to expect. And then you start thinking something's wrong because it's taking longer than you think it should have taken because you didn't, you couldn't be bothered to actually prepare yourself properly. So I have no sympathy for people like that who don't have time for education and then turn around and need help because they screwed something up because they didn't follow the directions that were offered because they took too long. If things take too long, maybe take it to somebody else and have them do the work for you. I'm trying to educate and help people become self-reliant and this takes time. You see uh, Studio Cat here? No Studio Cat yet. We have a stray cat that likes to come by uh, usually around this time to get free dinner. Come to think of it, <laughs> if I knew a place that was giving out free dinner, I'd probably show up there every day too. Free dinner and free scritches. Scritches? Free scritches and dinner. <laughs> I don't pet that cat. That cat will claw my eyeballs out. It is a feral cat. He's feral. I think he's just old and he's tired, but he's feral. So he's not as nasty as a younger feral cat. But I still don't want to see him starve, so. Okay, here we go. We're just about done. Richard says I should, adjust, I should just adopt that cat. Uh, I, it, Studio B is not mine. It's not my place to have a pet here. That cat adopted us. It didn't adopt me. <laughs> it did. I'm a dog person. That cat's going to have to become a dog. 
Okay, if you see it says no signal, that's because the system's rebooting and the BIOS is still applying even though you don't see anything happening. So again, I can't stress enough, leave the system alone. It is going to finish processing and it may be once again retraining the CPU and the RAM with the new BIOS. So it, it may sit here for again, up to three minutes or longer. There's nothing wrong. Please do not adjust your television. Let that go. <laughs> the outer limits. We control the horizontal. We control the vertical. Oh, we have to explain to kids what that means today. There's no more horizontal and vertical. All right, so we, again, the no signal that you're seeing on your screen is coming from our video capture card saying that the video input that we're using is not receiving a signal from that video input. That means the computer is not outputting a signal. And that's because it is not initialized yet, this new BIOS. So what, what I see people do is they freak out and they start turning things off. And it's, if I haven't said it enough times, you need to leave it alone and it's going to appear. Now, the reason I'm continuing to talk is that you know that you haven't lost the video, that we're still live and you can hear me and that you can see the clock ticking. So once again, once the system does come up, you have an idea of how long to expect this to take if you choose to follow through with this on your own system. Now it is finally posted and we should take us back into the BIOS, which it has. At this point, I'm going to remove the flash drive. We are done with our BIOS flash and you can erase this flash drive or at least erase the file off of it because we no longer will need that ever again unless we have another of the same motherboard also needing this BIOS. It's a one and done situation. I can grab my Windows 11 installation media and we can pop that in. If I can figure out which way the flash drive goes in, then I will go to ex exit. We can load the defaults here, load UEFI defaults, and then save and exit. And now the only thing the system has to boot from is the Windows 11 flash drive installation media. There's nothing else for it to boot from. So it should automatically start loading the Windows 11 setup without me touching anything. So again, hands off, we've just simply saved and restarted and we should hopefully get a post screen much sooner now any any minute <laughs> it's taking a long time so usually uh a post screen you know when you're first turning the system on that delay is normal but after that first time it should happen much faster so I'm a little bit concerned right now that this is staying on no signal for so long, but patience will win the day out and we do eventually get our post screen. I guarantee you that's not normal. I'm not exactly sure, maybe because again, every time we make a change to the BIOS, it might be retraining. Once you leave the BIOS alone, things will probably boot much faster in the future. I'm gonna go ahead and hit next and install now. And we go through our standard Windows 11 installation process, the same as you've seen me do. I always choose, I don't have a product key. I enter that later on in the process. I will be buying a Windows 10 Pro key from Windows, uh, from VIP CDK deals, where I get 30% off. It's like 16 bucks. I use the Windows 10 Pro key and I put that in Windows 11 Pro to activate Windows 11 Pro. I do not install Windows 10. I just buy the Windows 10 Pro key because you can use that to activate Windows 11 Pro, but Windows 11 Pro keys cost more. So if you want to buy a Windows 11 Pro key to activate your Windows 11 Pro, be my guest. If you'd like to save a few bucks, buy a Windows 10 Pro key and use it the same exact way that you would a Windows 11 Pro key, and it will activate your Windows 11 Pro and save you money. That's all it does. It just saves you money.
There's no other difference. Okay, so any questions for me? That's gonna wrap it up for today's video. We just crossed over the three hour mark and I just wanna see if there's any questions I might've missed earlier. Please ask them again now. Again, we need to thank Oystein, Peter Laycock, Gregory Howard, and Frankie B for their very generous contributions that made this build possible. And of course, thanks to all of you for your contributions and those of you that are members that help keep the content on this channel um, flowing so that we continue to have more new products and more new things to introduce to you. Richard says, another great PC build, Carrie. Frank, Jimmy says, be sure to back up your cat. If you lose your cat, you may need $300 cat out recovery. That I've done. Mara tells me to check my email. All right, let's, I haven't checked the email this whole broadcast, have I? Let's see. Let us see. If I could figure out how to use my phone, that would probably be the first step, huh? Well, thankfully, Windows is installing and I can bide my time. There's my email. Captain Blinsky sends a $25 Amazon gift card. Gregory Howard sent an additional $100 Amazon gift card. Speak of the devil. Frankie B with a very generous Amazon gift card once again. Frankie B says, I want to help you stay independent and say what you want to say about the products. Keep up the good work. Thank you as always, uh, Frankie. And of course, very generous contribution earlier today from our friend Buster. Peter Laycock said, hello, Carrie and Marlena. Just a little bit for tonight's show. I will catch up with you tomorrow, your friend Buster. We're so lucky to have these guys and you guys as members of our community. What an amazing, amazing community. Thank you so, so much. Let me go back over to our chat room. Did I, I get everything right? Okay, thank you. Let me just go back over to the chat here. Matthew Burden says, great build and great show. Can't wait for the next one. Right on, thank you. Elvin Shaver says, it's a fantastic day in North Car here in North Carolina. Nick Caffrey says, thanks for that, Carrie and Marlena. Really interesting and out of the ordinary. We'll be sure that you thank Peter Laycock, Frankie B, Gregory Howard, and Oystein, I'm telling you, this build was absolutely not on our calendar. It was well out of our budget. And these gentlemen stepped up without being asked and said, build something cool. <laughs> and I hope that's what we've done here today. Now, I'm not sure why these have all sold out. I mean, I kind of have an idea now that I've used it. It's pretty nice. They're about 400 bucks, but remember, you are getting a power, a modular power supply that's 850 watts and a 120 millimeter all-in-one cooler included in that price. You can build with an Intel or an AMD board, but I would consider doing one of the lower voltage chips, not the higher end K, you know, those K chips from Intel. Pay attention to what the wattage is on the CPU. And then whether or not you want to use a discrete graphics card is up to you. If you're not going to use discrete graphics, whether you're choosing Intel or AMD, be sure the CPU you're buying has built-in graphics if you're not planning to provide your own graphics card. Or maybe you want to provide a graphics card later. Maybe you want to build this in stages because the graphics card can cost twice as much as this whole computer. You know, if you want a new 4090 Ti, you could buy two and a half of these for the price of just the graphics card. So just bear that in mind and do know that you could add the graphics card later if you want to, as long as you get a CPU with integrated graphics. 
you're good to go. As you saw, we're already installing Windows 11. I'll finish the Windows 11 setup. I will then plug it into the network and go ahead and download updates offline, off camera, I mean to say. And that'll run for a while because I have a slow internet connection here. And then I'm able to simply clean up what little cable management there is, put those panels and top back on. We're done. I'm a fan. I like it. My honest opinion, I like it. That's one of the easiest builds I've ever had to do. And for the price, you know, the fact that we're getting that power supply and that cooler and the case for 400 bucks, it's not exactly a bargain, but it's also not a ripoff. You know what I mean? Like, <clears throat> if it was 300 bucks, <laughs> it'd be a bargain. But at 400, it's fair. It's a fair price. And it seems like it's built really, really well, as you would expect from the folks at Cooler Master. Uh, let me shout out a thank you to, once again, everybody who's contributed in Super Chat today. If I can bring that screen up. Come on, YouTube. What are you doing to me? Alvin Shaver with a $3 contribution. We have several $1 contributions in Super Chat from Peter VZ. Thank you, Peter. We have several contributions from our friend Paul O'Brien in Ireland, as always. Slancha, Paul. Thank you to David Graham and Alan Lindas, as well as uh, Gregory Howard in Super Chat, as well as the Amazon gift card. Our friend Planet Cryos joining us there with a Super Chat. Mark Gaines from Northern Ireland with a Super Chat. There's Ryan from Hamilton, Ontario with his Super Chat. Nick Caffrey, thank you for your Super Chat contribution, as well as Ron Makura, 3D Everything. And Ben Laird, Ben joins us from Scotland. And the membership renewals from Gregory Howard and Paul O'Brien, as well as uh, Mark Baggett. Thank you guys for renewing membership here. We will be live for our members only video that we do every Monday, one o'clock Phoenix time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern. A thank you to Marlena, as always, for the amazing work she did on today's thumbnail. I wasn't quite sure if this was going to be a part one and a part two. It looks like there, there's no need for a part two because, you know, it's just the cable management and putting the panels back on. We're done. So. Yeah, but I don't need to do that on camera. It just snaps together. There's no tools. It just goes click, click, click. We're done. All right, well, we can bring out the final build when it's done, but uh, there's nothing to really show other than okay. it's going to look exactly the same as before we put all the parts in it. Right. That's what it's going to look like. It will be turned on. Does that power button have an LED around it? I, I can't. Yeah, it does. That's what I thought. The little header only had four wires, so I figured it was the LED and the switch. So, yeah, you could see the LEDs lit up. But thank you, Mara, for all the work you've done and the video notes and the thumbnail and all the social sharing. Find me in Hawaii. That's uh, $9 and 99 cents in super chat from our friend Ken joining us from Hawaii. Aloha, he says. All right. That's going to wrap it up for us for today. Thank you so, so much for hanging out with me and we'll look forward to seeing members on Monday and the rest of you. I hope I will see you on Tuesday. We're live at one o'clock when we're live, we're always live on Fridays and we're always live for members only on Mondays. With regards to Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, or Sundays, it's just as time permits. We certainly have enough projects to cover. What you looking for? That's up here. It's up here at the top. I, we showed this off. We've got a video on the oscilloscope clock. Just go back to the, uh, the video section on my YouTube channel and we have a video dedicated to that. If you haven't seen it, it's really cool. It's only a three or four minute video, but we're going to go ahead and wrap this up for today. Thank you so, so much. We'll see you all again very, very soon. Until next time, bye for now.